All right then, gamers. Good, air, uh, good early evening to each and every one of you. Hope everyone's had a chill Sunday afternoon so far. Because things are about to get spicy from here on out. You are now watching Bounty Hunters FT7. And we are a weekly show match event open to basically everyone, no matter what skill level you are. And the name of the game tonight is, of course, as per usual, Guilty Gear Strive First to Seven Wins. I'm your usual host, QK, and without further smack talk, let's move on to checking what's in store for tonight. Because uh, we are a little behind schedule. Well, technically, uh, Bounty Hunters is not behind schedule, but QK is mentally behind schedule here <clears throat> in terms of, uh, terms of preparations. In uh, in all honesty, I don't have any preparations done. I actually forgot that I needed to polish up the card a little because uh, there's some new stuff that I've been adding, and I had to spar with a couple of participants earlier. You know, you know how it is. All right. So what we got: triple Norway setup into a quadruple Finnish setup, as per usual. Lots of Norwegian and Finnish players tonight. Uh, new names on the card, or I guess rather new names. We got Thunder Kitty uh, on the first matchup slot, going on uh, on a second tour of Bounty Hunters facing Hopland tonight. Hopland still rocking Slayer, being that uh, sort of nightless duel main still. Slayer and Nagoriyuki. Uh, Blisk and Zokis, you of course know on the second slot. We're actually getting. Uh, the quotations main event of the evening, which you could technically say Blisk versus Zokis is a little earlier due to uh, the scheduling uh, wishes of the players. Then making their debut on the third matchup slot, the worst guy, Faust from Finland. I didn't even know we had another Faust player. And I think uh, the worst guy also had a decent amount of support for, uh, in, on the chat earlier. So hello to each and every one of you, gonna be facing Mox Biken, and Mox is, I believe, on their third game on Bounty Hunters, one win, one loss under their belt, and looking to expand from that. And of course Link, Link, you know, chip action, quite fairly regularly on Bounty Hunters, Day though, Day Sin, from Germany. Returning back on Bounty Hunters, I want to say it's been like nine or ten months since the last time we saw Day. And of course, uh, being part of the Sin army, uh, yours truly, very close to heart. Uh, really love seeing Sin representation on Bounty Hunters in plentiful quantities. Uh, another player making their debut tonight, Ifrit Ramlethal, representing Russia in the matchup slot number five. I'm gonna go against Dora Bridget this time. Dora has been traveling through a couple of characters. We've had uh, Sin before. We've had uh, what Dora Rock after that. There was a couple of or one character at least in between, but has been doing the Bridget as of recent. Then two absolute iron, steel, hammered, whatever analogy you want to make. Uh, Regulars on the slot number six, Hywill Maria. Maria, of course, rocking her uh, signature Nagoriyuki. It's been a while, uh, allegedly, since Maria has, uh, you know, played any strive. I heard rumors in the chat that this is a two week break Maria is getting sort of coming out of. And playing, of course, from not from home, but from a friend's house. So <clears throat> that's, uh, that's a lot of. What should we call it? The sort of like uncertainty factors, kind of the same kind of factors that you encounter in a tournament setup where you're not just sitting at home in your underwear, drinking beer or whatever your, you know, <laughs> uh, beverage of choice is to get yourself relaxed. And then, of course, finishing the evening off, seventh matchup slot, McNuggleton Biken versus. Yeah, boy Spade back on Anji after that uh, release week Slayer shenanigans. <clears throat> Although Slayer Anji, I wouldn't say two very Spades like characters for sure, but it's 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 good to see Spades back on the uh, the usual 
uh, Anji shenanigans. One of the more entertaining Anji players that I've had the pleasure to cast for sure. But we should probably look back to the number one slot that is going to be happening just presently here. And let's also inform the players. I think Hoplan is already in the lobby. ID is here. All right. Players are on their way. So we got a couple of extra minutes to talk smack here. What does your true yours truly know about this matchup? Well, my my knowledge about Slayer matchups doesn't extend too far. We got the we got Johnny. Uh, representing a little more uh, long-range gameplay. They do say that Johnny, or at least Arxis says that we are working with a zoner character. It's a, I guess it's a t zoner with a twist. You are still a lot about that space control. If you can deal at neutral, you can create massive, massive explosive obstacles for Slayer to try to get through. And Slayer, as per usual, as in the past, as is now, is very horizontal kind of character in nature. It's kind of locked into these uh, railway arrays to a certain extent. It's kind of like a freight train that just comes at you and punches you really hard. But he can only move at, uh, very effectively at certain trajectories. So for Slayer, it's always been that, you know, back and forth uh, kind of axes that you get from Dandy Step and its follow-ups. And then, of course, Mappa being the, uh, well, the new premium neutral skip that is extremely good on Guild Gear Strive. Used to not be as good, but, you know, has always been that kind of a fast lunge punch that can reach the opponent at a moment's notice. So if you can prevent Slayer utilizing that kind of natural trajectory that he has on the, on the ground, those kind of archetypes and those kind of characters tend to do very well against Slayer, or very good against Slayer. Now, in terms of whether Johnny has sort of the time to establish that control over the screen, I am not quite sure. K-Mappa is a really explosive tool in Strive. It's 14 frame startup and basically covers up the range of half the screen extremely fast. You can't really can't really react to it. It's something that you have to prepare yourself, predict in order to call out. And the prediction, surprisingly, like the hitboxes of Mappa seem pretty good. So unless you already have something out that is extremely active and or disjointed, there's very few things that can challenge just straight up raw K Mappa just like that other than 6Ps. Of course, the new innate uh, sort of disadvantage for Mappa in this game is that it does get low profiled by a lot of stuff. So, of course, 6 Ps, and if you have any sort of other like sliding kind of moves, such as like Stun Dipper from Kai, Elkhart, 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 Elkhunt from Sin, um, any other things come to mind? I guess Soul 2D, probably, I would imagine. Get moves like that that can sort of go under, but even those are you know you have to be using them already. You have to have their startups or their low profile frames started well before the mappa comes out because mappa comes comes at you at extreme speeds. Uh, let's see, Thunder Kitty has difficulties loading the room, uh, which could probably we could try to fix it by making one of the players host the room instead. Oh, Signs of Life. I think Thunder Kitty has it loaded. Now, the biggest question is, can Thunder Kitty see Hoplan? <laughs> but 
Big Hop, I'm going to at least see Thunder Kitty. Many LGBTQ people in the community? Yeah. It's a... Guilty, Guilty Gear is a surprisingly queer kind of game. As it is. But of course, you know, through all sorts of nooks and crannies, we're also an extremely LGBTQ uh, supportive community here. <clears throat> for a couple of different reasons. Um, trying to figure out if the players can see each other. What is what is going on with Thunder Kitty's game? They can't see the station. Uh, that's an interesting problem. <laughs> it's like how the Thunder Kitty screen is just black. Uh, huh. Try to thr tr troubleshoot this. So we'll try to we'll try to make Thunder Kitty host a room, and if it loads properly, <laughs> better than the current Bounty Hunters room, then we'll uh, we'll move ourselves to that room instead. <clears throat> it wouldn't be it wouldn't be Bounty Hunters with a couple of uh, little scuffed. Details here and there. No problem. We're, we're used to it. We do this every week. We do it live. Sometimes there are a couple of bums. Bums ahead. Bump ahead? Reference to Slayer? Did everybody get that, huh? <clears throat> so in terms of which character Hopland prefers, prefers at the moment, not quite sure. I've seen Hoplon playing basically like 50-50. <laughs> Game crashed. Oh, is it the is it the potato mod that Thunder Kitty was trying to work with? Right, because I, I saw Thunder Kitty say earlier that um, they had a couple of difficulties with their PC and running the game. Um, what's the word you're looking for? Uh, as, you know, 60 FPS, that's that, that's the thing. Now, a couple of minutes, or we'll, we'll have to see how um, Thunder Kitty manages to get the stuff working. Also, be nice in the chat, whether we're a little late with the gameplay. Be excellent to each other is usually my uh, my recommendation. Especially when dealing with players that, or rather, people that you don't know. Being hateful, not serving anybody. You wanna be mad? Uh, go be mad on your own. Don't sour the moods of other people. Usually the problem is that the players just can't connect to each other, or rather the most common problem is that players can't really see each other in the lobby, which usually gets fixed by um, one of the players hosting the room instead. 
<laughs> but we are definitely working with a unique set of problems here for this one. Seeing if we are able to troubleshoot this in the next couple of minutes. We'll move on with the schedule and see if we can actually get stuff sorted out in the background. That seems good for now. And if the normal room can be loaded properly by Thunder Kitty, then we'll get to enjoy this first matchup. If not, we'll skip to skip to the next one, which is Blisk versus Zok. I think I saw both both those uh, gamers in the lobbies and or slash chat already. Also, howdy raiders from Jay's stream. How are you guys doing? We're still uh, getting started a little slow. Um, having some technical difficulties with the first pair, but looking good for now. Looks like Thunder Kitty is able to hop on the cab. It looks like we are go for the first matchup of this week for Bounty Hunters. Thunder Kitty Johnny from Norway facing Hopland Slayer from Finland. Now, like said, uh, Hopland has been running the Nightless duo kind of 50-50 since that release of Slayer. Let's see how this is going to pan out. So probably one of the, one of the things that you want to try to keep your eye on is whether Thunder Kitty is going to be able to keep out Hopland out consistently. Slayer really wants to get into this brawling range as badly as possible. You're usually, you usually don't want to try to scramble with Slayer. Slayer has some of the best uh, bang for his buck, a lot of explosive power for pretty much any hit that he can score. I mean, some hits you do need counter hits, but Slayer is extremely good at hunting, uh, sorry, hunting for those counter hits. And with this new version of Slayer, he can all also create some of those gunner hits on his own using the blood-sucking universe, which will make uh, Dandy Step follow-ups counter hit automatically and get you those big bad counter hit combos, which you wouldn't be able to get without the counter usually. Right now, ooh, nice whiff into a throw setup. A lot of characters have a very similar kind of setup where you can either try to play a safe jump or then you can kind of fake a safe jump and with a button land straight into a perfect quotation meaty throw situation. It's kind of hard to detect sometimes between the safe jump variant and the throw variant. Going through the wall again. However, Vampire still persisting. One of the hard or, or one of the uh, most defensive characters in terms of his modifiers in the game, so can take a lot of punishment. Who was able to completely avoid with a K Dandy step? Of course, not only that, not only do you move far away from your opponent with that K Dandy, but YRC has a very limited range where it can reversal on your opponent. Lots of damage. This ain't gonna give you a clean Oki though. You're gonna be slightly too far away to run, you know, your usual close slash meaty. However, block, make the opponent block anything and you're in there. Hoplan scores the first point for himself. Alright, try to fish it for, uh, for a counter hit right from the get go with that 2D. Slayer has actually a lot of really. Really uh, nasty wrong stock buttons. That's one of them. 
if you score a counter hit 2d counter hit oh my god even counter hit it's late hoplin though struggling to pick up those counter hits for now with a cross up getting the lice loop to the wrong direction this time but the damage has been already done any sort of chip damage is gonna be enough. Close slash into P pile cross up pile bunker. The classic. I believe around 20 frame reaction times for you to react to that cross up. So that's the easiest thing to do. You really have to be looking for it or use some sort of an option select so that you don't just get your uh, <laughs> you don't get your backstabbed. Right, the jump go. Okay, active prevents the master's hammer from going online. And now dealing into the guard break. This is exactly what Johnny wants to do. Spends the meter. Should be a wall break. Not quite the kill. But a complete reverse of the previous round. Now drifting into the close slash. That was a surprisingly far range close slash activation for Johnny. I think Johnny is one of the one of the like one of the best close slash gamers, if you will, in Guilty Gear's tribe. Big counter hit here though. Hoplan. Connects, gets the first loop, the second one drops though. The sort of close slash timing out of the tumble state can sometimes be a little tricky. So while Slayer deals massive damage, some of that some of the massive damage is hidden behind a small execution barrier. Ooh, fake the TK overhead. And the reversal should go through here. Sending Thunder Kitty towards the other way, being very, very cautious of Thunder Kitty's reversal back. Last chance to burst, Hoplan still in there, lands straight into the Mist Finder. And Thunder Kitty answers back. With, uh, with one of her own. Ooh, not believing in that setup from the Wild Assault, going for a throw. And now Hoplan, straight into the close range distance. Out of many, many knockdowns, you can do a, usually like a K-Mappa to scoot yourself right next to the opponent. Can sometimes be a little uh, hard to see whether, like what kind of frame data those situations entail. Sometimes you set up like a perfect MIDI, quote quotations, MIDI bite. Sometimes you can set up a perfect MIDI close flash. But it varies, varies a little. All right, get the throw towards the corner. Queuing up the safe jump. Was it a safe jump though? Yes, indeed it was. And trying to hard the burst. Hoplan not quite ready to bite yet. Especially since Hoplan is sitting on a round lead here. Frame trap. Using Ensenga. Queue up the mist finers. Those mist finers do reach quite far away and they cleave the screen. Those might be your one of your premium tools for trying to keep Slayer away and advancing on you. But speaking of close slashes, Hoplan scores a big one with this one. I think both of these characters are excellent, excellent close slash characters. They do have the super strong feature of their close slash just reaching very high up in the sky. So if you kind of try to go for a close slash or even a far slash usually there is a chance that your close slash will activate instead as an anti-air like situational anti-air then you hit it and then oh speaking of hitting it though going into the fully charged 5d sequence thunder kitty might have not been expecting that herself but ended up dropping it some guilty gear gamers actually don't know their fully charged 5d combos because they're at higher levels of play there generally isn't too much of a reason to ever go for one i think the most common like setup where you would get a fully charged 5d is like if you're punishing oh well wow, that thought we got a big it's like counter hit even though it was a simple one two three that's almost half of thunder kid's life and now hoplan is looking for potentially one more hit master's hammer there we go the 2pp mash that's definitely one option that you can take if you think that uh if you think that Slayer is gonna try to dash through you with that P dandy step and try to get a cross up. However, there are setups where your 2P P is gonna whiff. So for example, oops, I think I see 2P here. Yeah, we're still activating. Into the other side, close slash, basic one, two, three, and Hoplan. Threatening a third point here. 
Thunder Kitty with the lead in terms of the burst resources here. But this is season three. Those burst resources are gonna come back fairly fast, especially if you get positive bonus or if you get yourself stuck on the wall. With one, two, three, confirming with a super decent amount of damage, and Thunder Kitty has still 50% more where that came from. The deflect shield pushing the TK overhead away. Is that gonna be enough? Is that gonna break the wall? Not quite yet. Deal into it and staying very safe. Hopan unleashes the DOT, and that's gonna be punished. Great presence of mind there from Thunder Kitty. So a lot of the usual far range Johnny setups where you are trying to deal uh, into a long range situation and then slice the card with Mistfinder. Generally, even though those are DP safe, there are a couple of forward moving supers in the game that can actually challenge it very actively. And the Super Mappa Hunch, aka the Dead on Time, depending on what generation of fighter you are. Ooh, what? Great patience from Thunder Kitty here, was waiting for that burst for a very long time. Pop one was able to scoot to the other side, but not out of this pressure sequence. Difficult to convert otherwise, so no... Wait, was that? that was almost 100 into the, into the Joker trick. I don't think I've ever seen anybody trying to extend that. Either way, it's like... It's important to know what your character is capable of and what you're capable of as a player. So sometimes it's... it's completely acceptable for you to uh, go for a little easier combos, just do like a couple of hits into a super if, you know, your more optimal combos are harder to execute. Hoplon fighting out of the corner, switch sides, which is the 6-6, six, six, and or the P dandy special. Half of Thunder Kitty's life gone, we're going back to even the drift forward slows down Hoplon. However, from that far slash, Thunder Kitty was not able to complete the combo. I wonder if Thunder Kitty was thinking about a, 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 some, some sort of a unique route there, which many characters do get when they slow down the opponent's frames with BRC. And now Hoplon's corner pressure, it's late, it's gonna be minus three, but the spacing is very peculiar. Even from the bump ahead or it's late, the high-low, uh, follow-ups of Dandy Step, even if you are minus out of those, some players might not be familiar with the RPS situation. Skipping to the other side! Immediate burst from Thunder Kitty. Getting to hold Hoplan in the corner. Soft knockdown, rather even amount of life here, but one touch from Slayer. Is why did you take backdash out of the K Mappa and then punish with a close slash? That was great, great movement by Thunder Kitty. It's gonna seal this round and put Thunder Kitty in the leading position for the first time in this set. Of course, the two have gone super back-to-back -back so far, so there's a lot of opportunities for download still back and forth. Ooh, okay, the spaced deal here. Usually, when you are at a particular distance, uh, the deal, sorry, the bolt into deal is very reactable with either like a 6P or a DP if your character has one. From a really far distance, it might be somewhat, especially in Slayer has a very stubby 6P, so it might be hard to challenge for Slayer from certain distances. Now deal in two, just waiting for Hoplan's counter throw attempt, or a throw break attempt should we say. Both players with a lot of meter. Super gonna come from anywhere, 100, ooh, drops the combo! Hopeland reaches for that throw again! And Thunder Kitty says, nope, none of my pressure is gonna be interruptible with that. We are going airborne instead. 6k counter hit. It's a quick missed finder conversion, pushing towards the corner. Hopeland deems that it's time to get out of here. Really nice spacing once again, Thunder Kitty. So remember how I talked about how a lot of this matchup is gonna revolve around spacing and trying to control the horizontal sort of aspects of the round. Thunder Kitty has been standing on exceptionally good spots. Slayer has been, or Hopeland has been missing a lot of 2Ks, a lot of uh, two heavies, and those mappas as well. Oh my god, drifting into the 5D, a quick conversion into Super again. This will be a hard knockdown. Threatening with that. Ooh, he's probably trying to get a YRC out, but turn into a BRC. Usually the BRC is gonna be pretty okay though, because you slow down your opponent's frames. The Black Shield pushing Thunder Kitty away. What's the approach here? How do we get next to Johnny? This would be one of those options. However, whiffing it didn't even get an airborne hit. I think Thunder Kitty was already landed there. 
which will inflict the full massive full minus frame mind. repertoire or uh, massive amount of uh, maximum amount of minus frames on Hopland. There we go, counter hit 2D. Thunder Kitty knows that would have been a big combo if Hopland managed to complete it. A momentum burst towards the corner, frame traps, frame traps with that too heavy. However, when the too heavy doesn't counter hit, you have to be very fast at hit confirming into uh, into a pile bunker if you want to get your optimal conversion. Now my name, I come online here, catch the 2k from Hoplan. Rare footage of Thunder Kitty going for the reversal supers as well. Both of these characters share the same feature that they cannot really meterlessly reversal out of many situations they're gonna have to have that 50 tension to be able to go for a true reversal option through the wall it's like here it's a tough boy surviving that amount of damage tries to go for a deflect shield to push thunder kitty away however again with the quotations meaty throw option calling it out and sending uh, sending hopland to the next round without that 50 extra burst that they could have had risk and reward is the name of the game. Close slash. A little awkward there. The opponent was mid-air. So didn't get the usual close slash conversion altogether. Trying to hit confirm that it's late. The overhead staying at the perfect distance. And the two heavy going low in vulnerable. And calls out the big low from Thunder Kitty 2S there. Yeah, once again. So from that middle sort of mid-screen position against Slayer, it can be very dangerous to hit your low-profile moves because the two heavy is such a such a prominent button for Slayer. But at the same time, if you want to try to low-profile like K Mappa, you would probably have to go for some sort of a low-profile option usually. So Slayer has gonna self. Uh, what's a good word? to call it it's kind of like a full kit of options for you know you have this option that you would like to do one thing and then i have this other thing that calls out your thing and both of them deal massive amount of damage right your six p this is the mappa conversion going back and forth slay your movement you know it counter hit mappa k mappa into a big pile bunker straight into the wall slump and that's two hits and a decent amount of done already uh, already with that master's hammer lots of plus frames master's hammer really is one of the one of the nastiest tools it's very akin in my eyes to a slow command crab and the reasoning is you have to you absolutely have to rps command grabs grabs immediately because you can't just sit down and do nothing against them. Master's Hammer is the same. You can't set and block Master's Hammer under no circumstances. It's plus 24, gives Slayer one of his best mix-ups, cranks up your risk like crazy, and it's a guard crush, so you won't be able to buffer your options properly after it. So it's like, you block one Master's Hammer and you're in pretty much in deep shit. To the other side. Unfortunately, throwing the opponent out of the corner, I think Poplan was trying to look for that burst because they didn't cancel their bar slash there and the patience to wait for the burst to come out. Now Hoplan will have to go into this last route without any burst resources. But technically, same for Thunder Kitty here. TK, pick up. I think it's one of the reasons why Thunder Kitty has been going for that super conversion so much is that out of the TK Mistfinder, it's a little hard for you to sometimes to pick up the combo as far as I know. Now through the wall, hard knockdown. What are we working with? Thunder Kitty has only deflect shield, goes for it and barely makes Hoplan with the far slash. Did Thunder Kitty hit the button though? No, this will be a big punish opportunity. However, they missed their button press. I think the situation is sometimes a little tricky because the DOT, the super from uh, Slayer inflicts a lot of block stun. So you kind of have to have it in your muscle memory to press the button at the right time, lest you might go too early or too late for that matter. Now what's the mix up? 6-6 six, six, close slash, very classic Slayer gaming. Three, minus three from this range again. Thunder Kitty tries to jump out. However, Hoplan ready to call that out. 
I would say so far, those minus three MAPA follow-ups have been surprisingly good RPS situations for Hopland. I think Hopland hasn't come out of those situations, uh, you know, hasn't been losing those RPS situations much at all. Now, they've like chilled, just barely pushing Hopland away from that P MAPA. Able to get Thunder Giddy out of there. There we go, the TK, hard baiting the burst. Hopland not ready to bite. Hopland has been very conservative on hitting the burst when he is on that round lead. And now perhaps, oh, baiting back and forth. Both players very conscious of each other's deflect shield options. And once again, Hopland could have been waiting for the deflect shield, could have been waiting for... I I forgot to check if Thunder Kitty had a 50 meter there, but could, could have been waiting for the Reversal Super as well. Right, that time up a little too minus there. Tried to challenge, but getting tagged by Thunder Kitty. But now one combo into one, two, three. Ooh, through the wall you go. Thunder Kitty working with soon to be 50 burst and 50 tension ready to go. Convert it. This could go into a wall stick. And indeed does, gets the hard knockdown as well, spins every resource, but it's often very worth it in Gilded Gear's trial, especially in Season 3. Now, is that too high actually? Was able to get the... I think that was a case where DOT just couldn't reach there. Because it moves you forward really fast, and it has a very limited hit point, uh, hitbox when it comes to anti-airing. into the red wild assault. Look at that risk being cranked by Hoplan. Or sorry, being cranked on Hoplan. Still an issue here. Hoplan could go for the burst. Remember, one of the new changes is, there we go, that burst is gonna clear the whole risk gauge. And that's very, that's very big. Because if you, as a Hop, as Hoplan, if you burst here and still maintain like over half of your risk, the follow-up situation is gonna be a little troublesome to RPS. Get a interaction. Oh my god, the 2S actually anti airing Thunder Kitty out of the vault. TK Yos, <laughs> TK Yos, and TK Mistfighter. Wrong character here. It's gonna get enough damage out of that and once again bring the fight to five points even. All right, heading to the end game rounds here. Two for any player to get it. Hoplan misses a... Ah, oh, there we go, 6P. Able to call out the... What was that clash? 2P, 2P, preventing Hoplan from getting that P dandy into a cross-up pile bunker. All right, break the wall. Thunder Kid with a lot of resources here. 5K, the Nightless 5K. Such a good button. Almost like a bar slash mini in a sense. Or you could even remo remove the Mimi just being like a almost as good of a button as far slashes. Many far slashes are in this game. Hoplan extending. We have a couple of different options here. Working with 50. Ah, but getting crap back thrown as well. YRC, that 50. Oh my god, tries to go for a 2k. This is... Wait, was it... Which which one of these players was it that was YRCing? Was it Hoplan? If it, was, if, if it was Hoplan, then it should have been airtight to go for that 2k. <laughs> I already forgot that. 6p once again predicting the incoming K-Mapa. One of the go-to tools to RPS that if you have nothing else, at least your 6p should have your back. Thunder Kitty has been... There we go with the safe jump. Has the meter as well. Choose the more damaging one, and this time it should, with the use of this super and the wall break damage, should be enough. Yes, indeed, even on the nightless defensive modifiers. Under Kitty. First one to get the opportunity to R <laughs> RPS to try. I, I guess RPS is not the good word. To try their luck on ending the set right here and right now. Hoplon once again from the 6 heavy, tries to go for a P dandy step to cross through. But I think the FD that Thunder Kitty used was preventing him from doing that. First out the corner, Vault comes from a peculiar angle, will be able to counter the Maka this time. And from left to right we go, crush their guard, Cold Slash not hit confirmed. I think Thunder Kitty once again worried about this burst that 
that Hoppen really hasn't been willing to fire very often. There we go, finally goes for it. And a swift 6P preventing the game up from crossing through the borders of neutral. Are we gonna get the back shot? Not quite, and not even the, ah, the bait here. He's gonna stick, and it's gonna be round for Hopland. All right, immediate crisis averted. We can still manage, we, we can still uh, safely, I mean safely, quotation safely, uh, lose this round and still be able to come out of this unscathed. However, Hopland losing quite a lot of life here and will be put in a potential mix-up situation. Let's see how Thunder Kitty wants to play this. Very low on resources. What you would like to do, oh, it's that throw again. What you would like to do from those hard knockdown wall break situations, the best you want is just Touch your opponent with anything and you're golden. Now once again, the, the baiting... The baiting of the burst has not paid off up for Thunder Kitty. Overhead has to spend their own here. Hoplan, perhaps buffering. What you gonna do? Are you gonna hit it? Both these characters have a... Have a super that basically can react to the opponent's whips. The Joker trick, very fast. Full screen whiff punishes as well as the super Mamba Hunch from uh, from Slayer. Finds a big counter hit. <laughs> that was literally just a couple of couple of hits of risk and a far slash. Now Hoplan looking for one more. I think that's it. Can go for oh misses the input on last horizon, so won't be able to finish here. Hoplan still is quite alive and well. This should be enough. Bam! Hoplan goes to six points as well. And here we have the perfect script for the first matchup of the evening. The game's still in either player's grasps, but which one of them has learned the most of their opponents? It all comes down to this. Nice was able to slice the card, but missing the pickup combo afterwards. And now Thunder Kitty forced to spend their burst as well. Drive by Jump K going into mid screen position. Even though we weren't able to cash out on that combo. Oh, tried to go for a, for a very s Street Fighter like Shimmy here. But Hoplan, not faced by any of that. Crapping a Thunder Kitty by the color. Back throwing. And now looking for one more hit in this round. Deflection. Wait! A Deflect. I think that was the. It's late. Was so late, in fact, that the Deflect Shield. Uh, active frames had already expired, meaning that Thunder Kitty was basically in a punishable, counter-punishable state there. <clears throat> and now suddenly Hopland, one hit away from being able to close out the round. Again, the hard bait. His hard baits on the burst really making Thunder Kitty lose some very important value. Let's see if we... If Thunder Kitty gets a hit here, do you think she would bait again? Because that's gonna be the big question here. Hopland has a lot of meter though. There we go, there we go! The bait finally pays off! Thunder Kitty has been waiting for that burst for 10,000 years and finally, at the most crucial moment, gets it and goes into the last round with a little itty bitty tiny titsy piece of advantage in terms of the burst here. If let shield, the burst immediately becoming very useful factor here. Close slash anti-air. That's one, two, three. Hopland could potentially get a wall stick here. Yep. The good old pile bunker does the job. Both players waiting for that 50. They get it. Oh, the whiff punish. Is that gonna reach? That should reach. That cleaves the whole screen. And Hopland with the DOT whiff punish on Mistfinder. Able to. It was a back and forth ride. All the way through. What an emotional roller coaster. That absolutely. <laughs> that, that burst bait that Thunder Kitty was, wor what was looking for so long was able to get her the superior, only slightly superior position. But then in the end, it is Hoplan who closes it out. What a nail biter. Damn. <clears throat> And mark my words, it ain't gonna get any <laughs> any slower than that as we're moving to the next matchup here. Zokis Leo, Blisk Sin. Two characters, two players who are known for wild gaming when it's enabled. Zokis, of course, the old uh, big body player. 
<clears throat> but has been experimenting with some uh, other more strive oriented characters after Potemkin, such as Nagori Yuki uh, and Leo, which is probably, I think Leo is currently uh, Zokis' strongest character. And probably this matchup as well for Zokis, has been able to hone their, you know, matchup knowledge against Sin a little bit uh, across the week. We got decent amount of practice sets in Zokis and I. So, should have a couple of extra ideas for how to approach this Sin matchup here. <coughs> So this is a very, very, um, how should we put it? These are two quite standard characters as far as Guilty Gear Strive goes. Red Wild Assault users, uh, good neutral, good convertibility. Both are very comfortable being next to your, uh, next to their opponent as well. Have very explosive rewards, not the biggest rewards out of the cast. So neither Sin nor Leo is gonna do, uh, not gonna be able to deal the Nagoriyuki or Soul Bad Guy or Slayer kind of damage. But both of them deal surprisingly good amount of average damage. What I mean by that is most of their hits go into respectable damage. Sin especially is the sort of epitome of that. <clears throat> even though you don't necessarily get those like 70% uh, health combos, even on a close slash punish, Sin deals really good damage on just about any hit. Even the even the jabs, like 2Ps, 2Ks, can go into a DP conversion, and if, if you have the stamina to spend, you're gonna build a lot of meter, get into, you know, RTL range, then break the wall from anywhere on the screen. It just flows really well for both of these characters. But the characters are also extremely good at building risk, which has been sort of the Leo, uh, Leo shtick throughout Guild Gear history. So if you pluck a couple of hits from Leo, your risk is going to be cranked relatively fast. And then as a result, the hit confirms that wouldn't usually deal that much damage end up hurting ever so much more. <clears throat> Of course, both characters are are DP characters as well, and both characters have vulnerabilities during their pressure to all sorts of strong DPs. Of course, Leo, being in back turn stance, won't be able to block anything normally, so that is uh, that is a problem if the opponent wants to swing reversals. And Sin, uh, Sin pressure has a lot of gaps to you know naturally. So lots of opportunities to DP as well. Nice back jump here, anticipating that forward movement and getting that clean hit from Tyrant Barrel as well. Starting up very well, uh, nicely for... for oh, I forgot to switch the names as well. There we go, let's do this quick switcherino. So in fact, rocking Zokis and Blisk here. So after the parry stance, I forgot if it's... I think it's roughly even kind of a situation if you end up blocking it. YRC, get off me, run straight into the close slash, and gets the gets the uh, gets the clean hit, which will give you a maximum of bonus fra bonus frames and damages frames. But Zok is not ready to give up this round just yet. This is, is this is still the first round. The chaps are playing some uh, some 3D chess here. Getting the first hit absorbed by the parry stance, but there is still the nasty, nasty little execution game that you have to time your strike against Chip, uh, Chip, Sin coming down from that DP properly. Both players going for the throw. Blisk's timing, perhaps a little too early, might have ended up missing it. SDP into the corner, frame trap into a, a big burst from, from Blisk. Overhead into, yep, a very comfortable hit confirm. You can definitely make that hit confirm as a one hit hit confirm, but spending the stamina makes it so much easier, so much more comfy to do. Zok is ready with the six piece, and 
the DPRC should get the round. The first one for Plisk. Now, Plisk as a synth player has a very unique kind of, I think, affinity for jump heavy, which is gonna sort of mesh at the same time well and not well with Zokis and Leo. I think Leo is. Oh, I think got a small, uh, small controller disconnection there. Which has been a problem for uh, for Blisk as of recent. Ooh, the shimmy! So this was reaching for the burst here, or rather the, the throw. Ooh, back and forth! Which side is it gonna come from? Like I said, the jump heavy. Blisk really loves, loves to RPS with different kinds of angles, different kinds of timings, and different kinds of trajectories when it comes to uh, Sin, especially to jump heavy. So, yeah, case in point here. So the aerial approaches are gonna be one of the key focus points for Zokis to try to troubleshoot in this matchup, I feel like. Especially since uh, Leo has such a good S fireball, meaning uh, it's, it's kind of hard to challenge. It's not really like a fireball that you can follow up on. It's sort of like a, you know, stop doing what you're doing and then let's go back to the same situation again, kind of a fireball. And it can be a little difficult for Sin to challenge that. Unless you're already doing like a preemptive uh, beat driver. So you're probably gonna see Blisk taking the air fairly often here in in search of the uh, the successful RPS option. Speaking of the air option, Zokis has seen the aerial affinity of Blisk and just tosses them out of the sky. Now Elk, super good tool for RPSing the Leo's parry stance, because it is a low, and it can engage the opponent from very far distances. The downside of the Elk against the parry stance is that if there is too much distance between you and the opponent... Oh, had a little punish opportunity there, but Blisk went for the wrong move. The far slash is too slow to punish that, uh, that turbulence from Leo. Now, damage opportunity, won't be able to get the hard knock down. Oh, sneaky to the other side! And the far slash, or sorry, the back dash, the back dash, the back turn S on the way down. Zok is having the perfect timing this time to call out that DP. Remember, Zok is, when he's in back turn stance, he doesn't have the option, doesn't have the luxury of blocking that uh, DP on the way down, nor should you. The optimal punish is to always punish between the on the way up, uh, between the first and the se second hit on the on the way down. SDP working out for Zokis and RPSing with the parry stance here with the safe jab. Sometimes a little hard to time. I think that's a complete manual timing for 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 Leo if you want to go for like a safe 5B into pressure. There we go, there's that. I think that wasn't the punish. Again, that turbulence is only something like minus seven or minus eight, something around that category, which will make it impossible for S buttons from Sin to punish it in time. Now with the hard pay. Yeah, one, two, stamina should be in the wall even without a clean hit here. We go engaging once again from very safe distance with that jump heavy. Now, even though Sin has very bad vertical reach on his moves, what he can do instead is try to utilize the disjoints of jump heavy and try to stay outside of the opponent's anti-air moves like so. But Zokis with a big combo here, max corner, cash out. Going for the safe check once again. Blisk, oh, trying to go for a DP here, which Zokis does grab, tried to hard bait as well. However, Blisk is sitting on a one round lead, so can fairly comfortably hold onto that burst and take that advantage into the next round. Tries to backdash out of the jump slash from Zokis. Coming back with a DP, Zokis does the same. Brothers in arms, don't cross the DPs or cross them if you dare. We go cross up, nice block on, on Blisk there. Of course, the optimal answer is to always to throw the Berserker stance from Leo as he's crossing up on reaction. But if you, you know, if you want to just, you know, be safe and not ever get counter hit by that, then blocking is quite okay as well. Here we go. 
SL step, so he's not able to see that safe jump is good. However, the RC into the Berserker slash, I think, Blisk's controller disconnected at the very end there. Looked very peculiar. Blisk just not doing anything. And I think that's 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 been a that's been a problem that has been plaguing Blisk for a very long time as well. But as they say, in these competitive situations, when it's when it's a tournament-like situation, it is your your duty as a player to make sure that your equipment is working if you come to a tournament situation with a faulty piece of hardware, then your opponent, it's it's completely okay for your opponent to not show any mercy. There we go, Zokis, nice confirm, into a super as well, hard knockdown. And now, Difficult options here, could play the cross-up, or could play the safe, safe jab, which Zokis opted to go for here. And Blisk going with the safer option, saving, saving the burst for an extra round. Now, I could have seen Blisk bursting as well if they wanted to go with the hero route, because Blisk did have quite a lot of meter to spend here. But holding on, uh, holding in that kind of situation is definitely the safer play. Break the ball, soft knockdown. Both players soon nearing the 50% range or the 50 tension range where fun stuff starts happening. Ooh, the 6P actually reaches still as Blisk was trying to go airborne. First here, snatch out of the sky. Do we get the confirm as well? And what does that confirm look like? Jump slash air dash, jump slash, and the disconnection on the controller again. God damn. I mean, technically, both of those times when Blisk was in a uh, in a situation where the controller disconnected, it was already on his last legs. So it does it does suck that you didn't get the RPS there. But on the other hand, it was quite likely that Zokis was gonna come out of that victorious. Now throwing Zokis is DP. Both players have been utilizing that strike feature, which allows you to. You know, if you do a perfect meaty throw, it is gonna catch the opponent's DP startup. I think there really aren't too many fighting games before Strive that does have that, where a DP would just get beaten by by a throw just like that. There we go with the dash jump, jump heavy. The Blizz special breaks the wall as well. Perfect clean hit. What's gonna be next? Close slash, yes indeed. Keep it simple, not necessarily safe, but, you know, powerful option nonetheless. I think for, for very strong close slash pressure characters like Sin and Leo, it's completely okay even if you don't have a safe jump or a nice DP into the right direction this time. It's completely okay if you don't have a safe jump or a safe jab setup, because if the opponent chooses to send it and whips their DP, the round is basically over in your favor. Right, forced to take a or not forced to take a soft knockdown, but choosing to take a soft knockdown here, Zokis would probably love to save all of that, you know, burst resource into the next round. 6P, yeah, comfortably so. So those jump heavies from Sin Kisk, if they're coming from a very space situation, they can be quite hard to 6P. But if Zokis is on a point blank range like that as he was in the previous situation, much more easy to deal with. Now Zokis is gonna be the player who's jumping in this time. Guard crush! Blisk plays the right option there, goes for the DP. If you block that, you are in a bad situation. That guard crush from Leo is kind of like a Master's Hammer mini, if we compare it to what we had earlier on the show. Drift into a throw, Blisk not having the right option that time around, cancelling the back turn stance into plus frames. The Leo White Fang special. Now, of course, you can't, can't stay in the Mixerino state forever if you basically when you land any sort of uh, hit in the back turn stance, usually being the overhead option, the back turn heavy, you want to cancel your uh, your back turn stance and take the plus frames. If the hit doesn't land as a you know as a as a true combo, you can still keep up the pressure in your normal stance. A boxing Zok is in the corner. The S buttons from Sin are extremely potent. That's been one of the things that Zok has regularly talked about as well. How difficult in this matchup with Sin's 2S, especially being 
you know, so safe and very hard to with punish, very hard to challenge, how Sin can, in certain, certain screen positions, just box you and not allow you to hit many buttons. But it is, it is the reward that you score when you manage to, you know, get the first hit, knock your opponent down and push them into the corner. Corner is a very, very scary place and another scary situation here. Paris stands into a full conversion into Red Wild Assault and the Wall Break. This is the epitome of Season 3. It was a very wacky back and forth conversion. We had a couple of crosses, uh, sorry, uh, side switches as well. But in the end, the wall is broken as it is here by our hungry hero, Sin Kisk. Always a wall break opportunity for almost any kind of hit confirm as long as we have the 50 meter to spend. The jump scare 2D tries to heart bait. The heart bait on the burst ends up somewhat baiting the DP. But Zokis was way too high up in the air and didn't get the plus frames that they were hoping for. Now DPS from Zokis back turn stance. Yes, look at that spacing. He walks out of the elk distance looking for the burst. DPRC. RC from Zokis. Would Blisk burst here? No. I think so far Blisk has been very reserved in this kind of situations and keeping up the status quo not not doing any sort of hero maneuvers very nice deep delay there between the elk one and elk two that elk two counter hit when you have stamina to spend very very good hit from uh, from sinkisk oh look at that beautiful close slash don't walk forward stay still wait for the throw whip and then go for the big close slash that is the close slash pressure of gods not necessarily as potent as maybe, you know, Soul Bad Guy or Giovanna who have those, you know, plus, plus three close slashes. But I think when it comes to plus one close slashes in the game, Sin definitely has, uh, has one of the, one of the better ones. Now let's see if Zokis, yeah, wants to keep the corner position and avoid all that damage. Very value burst here and the close slash punish, yep. Same exact, same exact situation, but from the other way around. Zokis sees the 2S hoop stomp and goes for the DP. This is exactly what we were talking about earlier. Sin pressure has a lot of gaps. That doesn't mean he's, you know, only vulnerable to DPs, but also that there is a lot of bait opportunities for Sin. So if the if the play if the opponent tries to swing DP extremely wildly during your pressure. You can choose to stagger instead, and that's very strong and very valid. So this once again. Sort of switching between assuming... Oh, but the DP bait is gonna be big. Is Splisk gonna be not quite gonna be able to build to the 50 tension? Would have loved to do the Pirate Barrel to take the wall immediately. But this is almost better. Now, hard bait there, I think, from Zokis. Didn't want to spend the spent the tension to go for a soft bait and as a result Blisk is gonna be able to steal that round away from Zokis has the momentum slowly started to shift in favor of Blisk here is the big question it's the heavy fireball out Blisk chooses to just stay at a safe distance in the air there are a couple of options that you can Ooh, nice into the corner 2p Blisk doesn't believe in the pressure DP baiting back and forth, swings with the five heavy! And now, big question, are we gonna burst? Burst is immediately, but Zoki still keeping Blisk in the corner. DP back and forth, did we get the pickup? No, it was a little late there on the RC. And now Zoki is from the safe meaty, or the safe, safe, uh, what's it, safe jab into a throw. And then sees Blisk dash forward and prevents any of that from going down. Zok is maintaining the comfortable lead here. Three games of buffer. The training camp definitely seems to have paid off for Zok his. There we go. That's, that's one of the reasons why it's a, some, a little awkward sometimes for Sin or just about any character because the the fireballs from Zok his, sorry, uh, fireballs from Leo are very hard to just instant air dash over. You would have to go for a, like a super jump instant air dash. Oh, landing to the other side, getting a close slash, baiting the DP, but it's not over. The DP RC, always a mix up situation and Zok his finds the decisive hit. Do we get the kill? The air stance doesn't quite finish, but the close slash, oh my God. 
the willingness to press the biggest starter button. I'm not sure if that was a controller disconnect there, but could have been just, you know, Blisk posturing up for a co corner boxing situation. All right, one, two. Again, the R class is too slow to punish. I think it's that <clears throat> it's the same deal with uh, not just turbulence from Leo, but also the the artist formerly known as Rekka One, er er Erstis. Er er Erstis? How do you pronounce it? The funny, funny German name. Throws the DP here, and a safe jump. Zok has wanted to try. Is this really a safe jump? But you know, had the 50 meter to back it up as well. Go the air intercept, putting plus frames on board. Oh, Blisk not respecting any of that. Going into a very, very daring dash forward throw. Cheeky, cheeky. But perhaps the cheeky plays are what... Oh, again, the close slash anti-air. Man, those have, those have worked out so well for Blisk here. Compare this massive amount of reward from the close slash to the pixie amount of damage that you would get for hitting your 6p for many characters. Yeah, there is there is a massive reward difference compared to, you know, anti-airing with 6p or just about any other But Now Zok hits, scoots to the other side, gets a hit, wants to convert, can't get a wall break here. We have the burst resources, won't be able to route into it, but perhaps it's more strategical to keep the full burst here going into this last touch situation. One hit from Blisk could be what ends it. Oh, the very delay between Big 1 and Big 2! Zokis has to unleash the burst. We have almost 100. Zokis is a firm believer of the reversal super as well. Whenever you have 100, 100 has been achieved. Here it comes! And that's not gonna be able to be burst by Blisk! A quick confirm immediately into the super by Zokis! Perhaps the best play that could have done could have been done here. Because a lot of players know if you burst too hastily against the opponent's hit, you are most vulnerable to, you know, getting heart baited. And Zokis just, you know, sees it all happen, reach into the future, one, two, super, and then lock them out of their ability to burst. Very early bursts here for both players. Once again, Blisk choosing very safe air trajectories against the heavy fireball from Zokis. Uh oh, missing a pickoff. That could end up costing Blisk a lot. Do we get a wall split? Splat? Yes, indeed. Soft wall down. Wall down? Knockdown <laughs> from the wall. 2S, 2S. The 2S uh, fishing there is probably one of the most disjointed buttons from Malio. So whenever you see Zoki sweep the ground with that 2S, it's usually to try to play with as safely as possible. It has a very limited range though compared to uh, Sin's 2S. But it definitely makes it up with, you know, some of its other features like being a low and, you know, what have you. Now Blisk's corner pressure. Scoots into a very early one-hit heavy button into an overhead. Gets the 5k, 6 heavy loop. Decent amount of damage. Blisk is kind of low on stamina here and other resources. But Sin has very long combo, so if you can, you know, draw out your combo hits, you can draw out your sequences, you get to build a lot of your other resources back if you end up spending one of them. The three uh, strategical resources, of course, being the tension, the burst gauge, and then the stamina gauge for Sin specifically. To the other side, and again, caught with the low! And the jungle drums are here! Ooh, ooh, ooh. The old good stuff! The parry as an anti-air will lead into straight super break the wall! This is glimpses of old Leo! Of course, Zokis is an old Guilty Gear player, so definitely knows where, where these came from. The super punish, yes! Once again, go for the option that doesn't allow your opponent to have any sort of burst possibility. Not that Blisk even had that burst option available, just was a little too far from recovering it. And Zokis clears the Sin matchup with uh, with relatively flying colors, considering that Zokis has had some really, really tough matches on Bounty Hunters during the previous like half a year, nine-ish months. 
I think many of the many of the bounty hunters matches that Zokis has had haven't really turned out, you know, what you may call it, as Zokis would have liked. Uh, hasn't be, really been able to derive as much value from the preparation for these sets, but this time it's really great to see that Zokis as well has been able to get some uh, <clears throat> some success. You know, as they say. He did practice for the matchup quite a bit, and a lot of that seemed to have paid off. Now moving on, the third matchup tonight will have one of the two first-timers on Bounty Hunters. The worst guy, a Finnish Faust player, is gonna face off against Mox Biken. Oh, in fact, I had the wrong name here. Let's fix this fast. The worst guy. There we go. <clears throat> All right, let me see the, the worst guy. The worst guy enjoyers in the chat. Coming through with a crowd. Now, let's see how a rare Faust player on this current competitive landscape in Guilty Gear Strive is able to tackle one of the... one of the more... Um, what should I call it? The... I guess Biken is a little more of a meta character when it comes to, you know, the absolute top-level competition. Biken has been a little bit on the down low in terms of uh, popularity, of course, since the previous season, but still a solid Solid competing character. Faust, though, Faust started... Faust's, Faust's road through Guild Gear Strive has been fairly rocky to start out with. But I think the further into the lifespan of Guild Gear Strive we've proceeded, the more Faust has gotten all sorts of, like, quality of life things. There's still, you know, one or two things that could be better when it comes to quality of life, but we're, we're slowly getting there with our good doctor. Now, one thing is for certain, Faust is one of those characters who are a little more on the rare front when it comes to, you know, popularity. So matchup issues, matchup unfamiliarity could be a thing that comes up in events like these. And Faust especially being uh, being like the arbiter of low profiling frames. Faust historically can crawl under a lot of stuff, can RPS with all sorts of weird ways. And if you're not familiar, if you're not well versed in the, uh, the kind of RPS that Faust can bring to the table, it can be awkward to try to figure it out on the fly. Speaking of on the fly, here comes the cheer squad. Holding down Mox in place. Doesn't want to get locked down in the corner, but does so. Oh, careful with the bomb! Goes for a throw. That was that was great. Avoiding the explosion and not giving, let, not letting the pressure go by converting into the throw. That is not only a Faust-specific trick that you can use. Your opponent can also choose to abide by the same rules and try to, you know, avoid all sorts of bomb explosions by, you know, either intercepting how you as Faust player would like to move out of the bomb, but you can transition into a into a throw yourself if you have the if you have the opportunity to do so. Now lots of items coming through. I think that was a that was one of them was a meteor, I was about to say, and was able to convert it into a cross-up setup immediately. That was really great recognition by the worst guy. The worst guy. It's like only a couple of frames that you're gonna see which items uh, sort of are tossed off screen. And the worst guy was able to basically confirm that one of them was the meteor. Right, the aggressive air dash will sort of leave the trumpet behind. And I think it wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't make any sense to back off and pick it up at this point, especially when the tether is attached. That little guy hooping up the trumpet, is it? It's the worst guy! So getting a little bit of a combo breaker here, tries to cross up. Was that a cross up? I think that came from the front, perhaps. 
will go into the snip 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 a little too early there i think looked like crawling under yeah that's exactly the rps that we were talking about the worst guy really loves the item super here both players imbued with the afros can throw it if they so desire but instead goes for a meaty meaty big 5k you you were gonna think you were gonna think that the worst guy is gonna jump into jump d right because that's 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 basically what the faust players always want they just want to light up your afro right you thought and you did something and wor weren't ready for the uh for the meaty 5b sorry the 5k that's how it usually ends up turning out to be big counter hit yep immediate burst that's very good especially for these kind of neutral oriented zoning ish unique characters such as like faust asuka Happy Chaos, you probably want to burst with those guys like relatively fast if possible. Especially if you have Blue Wild Assault, because Blue Wild Assault is one of the weaker ones. Uh, so you can often value the Blue Burst much more than the Blue Wild Assault. And I think Faust is one of the, I think one of the weakest characters maybe in the game for utilizing Wild Assault. Having the worst form in the form of Blue and then Faust is not being very offense-oriented, very pressure-oriented character either. Like, has one of the rare minus on block close slashes, for instance. <clears throat> that is not to say that you can't do stuff with the Blue Wild Assault, of course, but uh, it's much more limited in nature. Now kicks the bomb to Mox's side of things, activates the little guy! I think that was actually the worst guy who manually activated the little guy. Is that even possible? I, th I think that's possible, right? The Afro Explosion... I thought the Afro Explosion was basically meant to hold Mox in place after the tornado ended. Alright, apply the Afro again. Now the guess. Save jump or other shenanigans available. Going for a throw themselves. Might be able to get out of this sticky situation. The worst guy doesn't have a burst here. Has a lot of meter. However, we are working with one of the slowest reversal supers in the game when it comes to Faust. We have the reversal super PRC option. Or just go for a wire, see, that works as well. Oh no! The, the Afro expired just in time! So, the worst guy ended up whiffing their 5B there. Still ends up procuring the round. Happy little accidents, as they say. The hammer is coming through, so Mox won't be able to engage there. This time, though, the donut not quite as threatening. So, Bike able to power through. Attach the Kabari, and now potentially threaten with the high lows. Good RPS from the worst guy, was able to jump out of the Kabari. Mox wants to keep this position, but worst guy immediately into gold burst. We might see some item supers very soon. Good item awareness. The little guy activates. Going airborne and finding the jump slash take throw from the plus frames of the, the Kabari. And because the Kabari is attached, you get new kind of really strong combos for bike and in season three a really cool showcase on those new combos as well i think it's like if you're fighting against a character who has less than average type of defense modifiers you're probably gonna look at like 40 40 percent damage combos for biken out of a throw meterless when the escobar is still attached Right, able to find some fish here. And now lots of items that are kind of annoying to approach on. The bombs and especially the hammers. Oh, there was a counter hit there. Won't be able to combo into the bomb. The Kabari, sorry, the uh, the Yosan from a, from a pe peculiar angle. Momentarily defending the airspace, but the cross up burst into... Got the horn? The burst, wow, that's just so much, so much stuff thrown back and forth. The jump slash, the instant air dash jump slash from perfect spacing. Able to tag a hit, but if you connect those air normals from such a long distance, they won't be able to convert into anything. However, counter hit at that spacing will give the BMB combo to Mox. YRC, get off me. That's airtight low. You can't do anything about that other than. Oh my god! Slips into their own banana peel. That, 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 and something. We are number one. The little guy's coming. Jumped a little too early and plummeted into the instant air dash, which ends up landing the worst guy into his own. Or, I mean, technically, in the opponent's horde of mini Fausts. As that, uh. That trumpet can be contested and picked up by your opponent as well. One of the more uh, 
volatile items in Faust's toolkit, if you if you will. Oh, wouldn't, what, wasn't able to see the burst during that RC slowdown. Combo into three, not two items, but three items. All right, we're pogging. Like the item combos aren't really as uh, as. Oh, oh my god, there was so much damage on the on the worst guy. Both players getting massively. <laughs> shaved their life by the items that was actually very critical for the worst guy ended up taking a massive massive bomb starter in the face and that's i think that's no no small damage in gildegear's tribe either real actual bombos <laughs> Now, there is a lot of gravity scaling when it comes to the items in Guild Gear's Tribe, so you don't quite get to see that, uh, like the super cool bombos that you could see from Faust in previous iterations of the game, like Exert and Plus R. <clears throat> but, you know, I think it makes... Knowing that you... Actually, never mind. Let me put a pause button on that. As the worst guy has been able to flip the positions, find the items, combos into the hammer who picked it up. It was the worst guy who picked up his own trumpet. And the afro. Not quite getting the super gun combo here. Both players trying to find a decisive hit here. Was able to swallow a hammer, which could be utilized in a pinch as a as an anti-air of sorts or to just hold down the opponent you can actually see in the bottom right corner of the screen in the common version of the Gildia Strive the item that Faust currently has in his stomach which can be then plummeted forward with a, with a special command All right, eating a hammer again must taste taste pretty pretty irony. There we go. Ooh, the, I was about to say we'll have to be scared of the hammer, but the small hitbox that Mox was able to compress their their character in, completely dodging the hammer arc. Oh, slip that! He slip onto the banana peel, and I think Mox actually picked that combo up. It was a one damage combo, but still, hey, they all count. The item combos. Ah, oh, the Afro Explosion, there are so many combo breakers. Nevertheless, Mox still able to get a throw here. So the, the meaty situation didn't quite work out for the worst guy. 2k into an item toss. Now, even though Mox got the throw... Oh, never mind. I was about to say, if they go for the full conversion here, the little guy might end up posing a threat. Another combo breaker to the full combo, but luckily Mox didn't need too much damage. Just get a throw and then big OPG slam with that six heavy. We'll be able to deliver enough damage to not have to fuck with any of those little guys. There we go with the jump D counter hit once again. Mox got one of those earlier as well. The downside is that you're probably not going to be confirming into a lot of damage from those. It is a very flashy hit and has a lot of oof behind it. Careful, careful for the little guy, he's gonna activate, and now, yeah, has to spend the burst to get out of there, especially since Mox was wearing the afro as well, which will, uh, you know, improve Faust's mix-up potential and pressure potential. Probably a premium position to burst against Faust if you are, you know, <laughs> cut up in the corner like that with, a fa uh, with, a, with an afro on. 50 meter, give up pressure, spend the blue wireless off to keep up it even more. OTG is available, close slash, bam, two presence of mind. Alright, tries to fish for the jump D again. This time the worst guy just happily, safely backing out of that ground stock situation. Throw the hammer, can't do much here. Yeah, that was a very safe 6P to play. If Mox tries to go any any sort of air shenanigans that the hammer in the air is just gonna put a stop sign to any of their plans. Crawl under that far slash the foul specific RPS. And the little guy holding down the fort so you can you can use the mix 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 that is usually like on, on regular hits, not the most safe thing on block. But you can definitely combo that mix, mix, mix cross up potential with uh, things like activated little guys, or maybe hammer in some situations, or afros if they're lit. Things of that nature. And in fact, 
the, the nastiest Faust mix-ups really come from your ability to recognize those situations when you can set up, set up all kinds of nasty things. When you can afford to go for those unsafe hits with the item coverage. Uh, points went the wrong player, so yeah, that's a good point. So two on worst guy, right? So three, three, two, three, two. Yeah. All right, Afro has been installed. Goes into this empty low. That, that's a very peculiar setup as well, because the worst guy is going for a very late empty low, or like goes for an empty too heavy which is a very slow start a button i wonder if that's a like a hard call out on a backdash or something or if the worst guy is just missing a button there Quick forward we'll be able to put so oh, okay staying safe with the mix 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 6p from very high up one of the furthest reaching 6p's in the game however not able to convert into a clean pressure situation mox says get me out of here Right to the other side. This time it was a jump slash, so striking from the wrong direction. There is an opportunity or an uh, option to strike from the backside, which is exactly this. Thank you, Mox, for uh, providing me a ample example on command. That yours and does strike behind as well as front. Afro has been picked up. Ooh, there. Careful here. It's lit. Immediate burst out of that. Gun Super will punish the 100 ton hammer, but also the impact will put a stop to Mox's uh, advancement on the ground after the Super. Do we get a bounce? Yep, combo. A little guy still holding down the fort. Has to hold it. What did we get? Oh, their own banana peel there. And there would have been so much damage to come. Both players exploding, but definitely favoring the worst guy here because they did have the life advantage. Horn is on the ground, and whenever the horn is thrown, usually both players will take a very aggressive stance and try to sort of race towards that horn in order to pick it up. But funny that, worst guy did throw a Im immediate meteor after that as well, so <laughs> was able to combine it with a, with a cross-up mix-up as well. Jump slash, such a good button for defending your airspace with. Look at the aerial hit, he's gonna go into a big damaging combo. Damaging combo is something that is not usually in Faust, you know, vocabulary. But look at that, the teleport upwards, perhaps predicting that the gun super is gonna come out in the next, you know, 30 frames or so. <laughs> and, the, and the target appearing from a completely different direction. All right, we are back to the even Steven situation. 3-3. Three, three. Been all, so, all sorts of back and forth plays here. 2B, once again. A 2S plus of source. 2B from Faust has been, you know, historically a very hard button to challenge from many people. I think it's, is, this, is it a seven frame? Yeah, seven frame button that just reaches really far away. All right, nice. Drive by Yozan out of the corner, able to evade the 5k from the worst guy. YRC to buy plus frames. <laughs> Mom, can I have a can I have 50 for YRC to combo break with? No, to start my pressure from ooh big six heavy counter hat counter hit anti air and the little guy coming to assist as well. Oh, that's to go for a 2p, but the parry. I think that was the first parry of the set as well. So Mox has been very, uh, very frugal with those. Lots of junk coming in Mox's way. So won't be able to break out of the corner just yet. However, now, plus frames, guaranteed. Cover the attachment from that blue wild assault. But wasn't able to keep it up. The buttons from the worst guy putting a stop to the pressure from Mox. Pushing with a jump D once again. However, I think Worst Guy at this point has learned their lesson. Oh, straight into the fishing pole. Oh, uh, okay. I mean, we're, we're, we're gonna take that. A little bit of extra damage there from the little guy. I wonder if that actually reduced the damage because of the increased amount of hits. Who knows? Hammer. Yeah, luckily the, luckily the two heavy did move Mox forward and was able to dodge the hammer with that. But, oh, the banana peel and the explosion. 
able to get back in the heat of things. The air scarbody too slow whenever your opponent is mashing. They can definitely interrupt the air scarbody no matter what button you're trying to connect it from. Unless that button is blue wild assault, of course. That is one of the guaranteed ways of attaching it. Little guy is activated. Has the block. Nice spacing there from the worst guy, throwing a lot of items. I think I saw a lot of, lot of hammers. They're bouncing around. Oh my god, that, 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 the bomb actually pushing the worst guy into a point blank situation. I, I, I have no idea what kind of frame situation that was. My instinct tells me that the worst guy must have been minus because they were the guy who blocked the bomb, right? But there might have been some junk <laughs> for Mox as well, and they might have been in block stand. I mean, it's it's a blink, blink and you miss it kind of a situation. <laughs> Lots of things are happening, for sure. Damn, we 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 keep talking about how how damn focused and how damn locked in you gotta be on the Asuka matchup, but you know, get a load of this guy, Faust and the items. You gotta be very very, you know, eagle eyed to be able to spot all of it. And once again, and not just being able to spot, spot it, but being able to come up with a counterplay on the spot. Now cross up into the banana peel. Careful, you might trip yourself in block stun, so we'll be not affected by that. We'll be able to pick the hammer, sorry, the, the trumpet here. Little guys holding down the fort, but also... Okay, the 2P. Man, this is a this is a very fast-paced matchup. Both players are are flowing from situation to situation extremely fast. Now the anime dash was able to space mix 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 so that we don't remain in a in a point blank punishable position. Missing the bounce on the combo. The afro is still attached. It takes quite a lot of time for the afro to expire naturally. It, in the end, it does so though from the front. Blue Wild Assault. Wow, that was a lot of respect from Mox there. <laughs> That's so nasty. I think he saw, he saw the hammer coming, which means, you know, if you're trying to mash, it won't do anything. So dashing in, threatening with the command grab. If the opponent mashes out of the command grab, they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna be combo broken out of that combo by the hammer. That's just layers upon layers with this guy. The item toss is literally, like, it's a very unassuming move on the surface. And, you know, you might think, oh, I'm just, I'm just gonna throw these items for maybe some extra value here or there. But no, that's not, that's not how you play this character. You see an item, you already know a setup for that. If you're a, if you're a world-class world Faust player. And then it's all about, you know, knowing those very niche, weird kind of setups that perhaps your opponent has never seen before or, you know, just is not prepared for. All right. Oh, the little guy is gonna come back. A little bit of a combo breaker there at the end towards the combo. Big counter hit, immediate burst from the worst guy. Float past the 100 ton hammer. Speaking of hammers, we're gonna have to block this one. How is this bomb gonna play out? Oh, Bombo! Wasn't quite able to pick it up. Any hit would have probably been able to done it, do it. 6P trades into the hammer, and here's the reversal super. The first one of the set. Both of these players, very, very patient holding onto their uh, flagship defensive options. And the worst guy finally re releases theirs. Now that option is definitely on the table when it comes to any subsequent future RPA situations of the same kind. And we will be able to go through the wall here with the super... Oh, misses the input though! I'm pretty sure that 2S was supposed to be uh, Tenshijin. Go again. This time, the worst guy is not quite ready to unleash the burst, but also probably was in no position to even want to uh, release it. For we are saving that for the next round. Now speaking of bursts, Mox releases theirs very early. Backlash out of the 2P. Worst guy does the same. That burst actually took Mox into the little guy. So very advantageous burst there. Get a command grab. Afro, what's the mix up this time? Going straight into the mix, mix, mix. Is it just me or is worst guy 
like the most un what, what's it what's it called like untraditional kind of mix-ups out of that uh, command grab you usually see like just safe jumps and maybe into you know land into a, another command grab worst guy has like really interesting layers and it keeps i think it keeps working out for the most part as well unorthodox that's the that's the word i was looking for thank you maria damn aphasia comes very early it seems for QK. but now the worst guy is very close to wrapping it up unless i miscounted i'm pretty sure that that's three uh three six still yeah my right. horn has been tabled picked up by the worst guy as well it's gonna give a very comfortable way to mix it up with six heavy if you so desire the follow-up situation though from the six heavy is not the best it's one of those kind of wish confirm kind of overheads where you you're praying that it hits and if it doesn't then you probably have to go for something rather unsafe as a as a result the perfect kind of net play overhead as they say full combo dropping it just in the precipice of breaking the wall and now yeah any hit is gonna do it that's a really cool way of routing it. I think the worst guy purposely chose to not break the wall so that they could maintain the corner, box box in the corner, and then kill kill them off the next hit instead. Nice jump out of the Kabari. And the, ah, the Meteor is not quite providing enough advantage to, you know, stay safe after the mix, 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 it turns out. To the other side, drive by Yozan as we call it in the industry. Now, gonna throw a lot of items. Not getting super value one, so not immediate mix ups available. However, the Afro might be the best reward that the worst guy got from that item super. Let's see if we can make it count. There we go, extending your hurt box just a little. Generally, is gonna matter against grounded opponents much more than air, uh, so airborne opponents. But you know, we take, we generally take any sort of extra hitbox, hitbox enlargement that we can take. And just like that, the worst guy clears their first FT7 on Bounty Hunter successfully. Very great item, uh, item utilization. Very great presence of mind on a lot of those item situations. I keep just keep saying this whenever we have Faust on, that every single Faust just seems like they have their own favorite kind of things that they want to do with the items so every faust tends to like do slightly different things maybe slightly different mix-ups maybe uh you know converting situations differently and that's really really cool uh considering like you want to have a lot of player expression on your characters and faust definitely one of those <clears throat> All right, on with the show. The fourth one will be another Sin matchup. Oh, baby. Vlink Chip, representing Spain, is gonna meet, for the first time in a while, Day Sin from Germany. It's been a while since Day has been on. Almost like a year, 10-ish months, if if uh if memory serves correctly in fact did they used to play sin back in the day let me let me actually check check the records so we've seen day on bedman zato and mostly zato i think yeah that's 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 kind of what i thought as well i'm like wait a second day sin have we ever seen Taeyeon Sin before? <clears throat> as far as the matchup goes, of course, you know, without stating obvious that, you know, uh, <laughs> Big flagpole hurt Pixie Ninja. 
Uh, this is one of the trickier... I, I think many Sin players uh, marked it as one of the trickier matchups to play. Because uh, you are kind of like a archetype that wants to play, play neutral, box the opponent in advantageous positions. But S Chip kind of has an affinity to fight all of that very, very well. You can't really whiff a lot of stuff at neutral against Chip being, you know, Chip being one of the fastest characters in the game. So even very safe buttons such as like 2S, for instance, for Sin, even 2D, those kind of buttons are just not safe to whiff at all. <clears throat> so that poses a very interesting kind of conundrum that every single character in Guild Gear Strive have to sort of tackle when it comes to Chip matchup. You probably have to use your K buttons much more than your S buttons and any any slower buttons like that. <clears throat> so let's see how Day is equipped for handling this. Into the overhead. <clears throat> Chip is, as a character, very good at building meter and then utilizing that meter for very explosive, fast mix-ups. As well as you know when you you like chip has kind of the same same vibes as sin whenever you land any sort of hits those hits are probably going to convert into a kara super into a wall break and then you're just going to flow really well you're going to you know refund a lot of your resources and then the opponent just doesn't manage to get an like just doesn't get out of your pressure very easily a very super good timing on the burst for blink was able to uh, burst just before Day's Tyrant Barrel goes online. Basically the holy, holy grail of blue burst timings. Whenever you can, you know, burst a super that would wall break otherwise, you'll be, you know, not just able to get out of that combo, not just avoid the wall break, but also take the 50 bursts out of the opponent's uh, tension gauge. And that counts for that counts for a lot in a in a very resource management oriented kind of a fighting game that Guild Gear is. All right, 2K, the, one of the fastest buttons to check after the minus uh, is it minus minus three on uh, on big through two. I, I play this character and I can't remember if my big two is mi minus three or minus four. I'm pretty sure it's minus three. Don't quote quote me, quote me on that though. Oh, the 6P actually still caught the backdash! I think, historically, uh, Chip is, you know, even though he is one of the more mobile characters, Chip tends to have really, really, uh, really average backdash when it comes to backdashes in any Guild Gear game. And I think it's it's the same on Stripe as well. Alright, to the other side, mixing it up. Small Mosquito Bites, as they call them. YRC, get out of that plus 3 situation. 6k is an okay position to reverse the situation with the YRC. Oh, the jumpy actually landed there in the pressure. Still could be anybody's round. Dash deep, 2k. And then break the wall. Unfortunately for, for Blink, wasn't able to... Oh, goes for a preemptive 6p, which will be too fast for Day's own good on that instant air dash jump heavy. To S, no cancel into anything. There is a little bit of RPS there. If you can space your 2S really well as Sin, then Chip's reversal DP might not be able to take care of it. Generally, Sin, Sin 2 Heavy is quite vulnerable to any sort of DP cancels because, you know, even on no cancel, it gets punished by faster ones. And I think, I think the Chip has a 9 framer as well. Right through the wall. Day has so many resources here. What are we defending with? Walks wrong on the in on the uh, on the safe jump, and will pay the price. Go down with all of that meter. But hey, that's how it is in fighting games. You still have to sort of, unless you're willing to go into just a gold burst immediately or a reversal deflect shield, you'll probably have to still block the first hit successfully. And I think Day was crouching there. Could have been a could have been a miss input on DP as well because you know crouching input is one of the, one of the you know six two three inputs. Right, into Kara Super. This is where it begins. This is where the fun begins for the ninjas. And just everything that you want at this point is to just make the opponent block anything, and the cash is just flowing in. 
Day, however, finds the DP, finds the Kara Ox RTL out of the DP as well. Being a full screen position, won't be able to get the heart, uh, the, the wall break, unfortunately. You would need 100 meter for that one. All right, missing with the Wild Assault. Day waking up with a 6P. Seems to be the right button of choice here. Getting whiff punished by that instant air dash jump heavy there. And a guaranteed throw. I mean, I say guaranteed, but I think a lot of the times from that air dash, you still have an opportunity to tech out. But that will be kind of like the only thing that you can do. Let's pick up once again, converting into a 6k plus 3 in the corner. However, like I said, boxing boxing chip in the corner, so difficult. It's, it's one of the one of the favorite things for sim players to do is to just keep your opponent in the corner and don't let them out. But Chip having access to a really, you know, fast acceleration jump, triple jump, and all sorts of funky ways of, you know, coming down, you know, dive kicks for days, alphas, you name it, is, you know, hard to find the trajectory. Oh, we were talking about how, like, are, why are seeing that 6k plus 3 might be an option to take but here's the other side of the coin day if they don't choose to check with anything afterwards you can definitely recover out of the 3k sorry the the 6k fast enough to bait the yrc especially when done as a as a media setup All right, we're close enough to the corner. So we're going with the Rekka, uh, the Rekka Kara Super option. And now, 2K still caught, caught in the RPS as a result. Like we say, if you don't punish Sin between those DP hits, you're gonna have the RPS. Is there gonna be a follow-up or is there not gonna be a follow-up? Throw, one hit, into a midi low. The favorite move of all Sin Kisk gamers, the Japanese guts, or the, the weeb guts in this case, I think. Because uh, Chip Lore-wise is not really a Japanese character, is more of a dirty weeb. But still, weeb or not, has the, has the Japanese spirit, and is one of the highest guts characters in the game as a result. Ooh, the wall once again, heart knockdown. Do we have the punish? No, I think Link has had certain difficulties finding the uh finding the right timing there yrc completely negates the tyrant barrel i've caught the back dash l comes really good tool for that job however the instant air dash jump heavy with punishing beat driver beat driver a lot of recovery frames one of the most dangerous tools that you could be using against the ninja frc Pressure reset. Where are we going? Six feet whipping. Oh no! Do we have it? Wall stick? Yes, indeed. And blink with a very tricky sequence there. I think re trying to reach for the alpha plates with six B is is a very dangerous kind of ordeal. Speaking of dangerous, this is a uh, up not close enough to the corner for for that route. Coming around with a DP, so that's gonna be safe for now. Two in two spent stamina. Oh, I wonder what Blink was trying to do there. But whatever it, whatever it was, it was definitely not invulnerable on wake up. And as a result, they will be able to even it out two games apiece here. All right, to the other side. Momentum bursts. Looks good here, but chip in the corner, and we get the mixer. Ooh, I think they wanted to go for the empty 2k once again, but missing the timing, which will make that uh, that throw mix up, or that mix up after the throw vulnerable to a reversal throw. Okay, with the 50, what are we doing? Back dash. Does it get punished too bad? Oh, until that air back dash in the corner. Wait, the bunky mess I actually missed. A lot of spaghetti on the floor. Both players whipping everything at the kitchen sink. But it ends up being in days uh, disadvantage at the end. You know, punishing Sin DP, uh, not the only way to go about it is to punish between the hits. Making the whole DP whip altogether is one other option. And I think Blink has had more success with uh, that approach to the Sin DP punish. 
Once again, 6B swung a little too early. So the air approach will end up scoring roughly 40% damage for Blink into... Oh! Damn, the Leaf Crab has some various kind of, uh, you know, outcomes here. Sometimes it can end up actually chasing your backdash, but this time with a massive backwards moving momentum from Sin Backdash, completely able to avoid the Genrozan. Here we go to the other side, try to throw. The second throw works out, missing a jump heavy. No reaction from Blink this time. The risk is building up using the... Oh, okay. I think... How much how much risk do you need in Strive to get a guaranteed counter hit? Is it more than half? Or is it actually... It's, no, I think it's in Strive it's actually full that you need. Speaking of counter hits... I think this is this is the blink this is the blink unique special skill and uh, the kind of RPS that she brings to the table with her chip. After the Rekka, the spacing traps and then the usage of five heavy is what has you know has sort of sealed many a players, yours truly uh, included, in uh, a very tricky kind of. Uh, <laughs> You know, mix-up situation that is sometimes hard to defuse if you're not ready to pick the right option. Speaking of picking the right options here, Day scoring a fast round here. It's only a couple of touches that you're gonna need on the opponent on Sin Kisk if you get the good ones. Minus frames into a DP. The Sin Kisk classic. There we go, this time the timing was right. If you have the courage to swing with the far slash, swing immediately and you might find fortune in the Rekka RPS. Ooh, whipping a DP off screen. However, Link still managing to punish that one. And you know what's coming. Yes, indeed. 100 meter per day and very close to full burst as well. So lots of options available here. DPRC, yes indeed. YRC, oh, but that was that was a YRC touch on airborne. So I think I think this was actually not a true punish for day, right? But I believe it's it was still day's frame advantage. Sometimes, sometimes you know when you connect stuff on airborne opponent, it uh, it creates some very peculiar kind of frame advantage situations, especially if what you're connecting is usually very minus. You know, sometimes stuff like even DP is gonna end up being uh, kind of hard to punish if they land on an airborne opponent. Through the wall once again. Please let me touch you. DPRC, yep, wanna avoid that block string at any cost, any means necessary. That was absolutely the right kind of play here. DP, RC combined. We can play to break the wall, unless very close to that burst. I wonder, I wonder if Link was actually trying to preemptively worry about the burst, but that hit that she chose to bait after actually didn't build enough burst today. Or four day, rather. All right, good 6P this time. I think that was the, the first clean 6P anti-air of the set against the instant air that's jump heavy. You definitely have to have those on point against Chip if you want to have a, you know any sort of success at neutral. DP. Ooh, and the RC baiting the first. It's not like Link had a lot of uh, options there. Just like, think about it. They could have actually FRC'd instead as well. And so you're kind of on a clock for, you know, how many more hits you have before the, uh, <laughs> before the strikes just kill you. All right, DP's back and forth. It's developing into wild exchange of reversals. Can we get, ooh, okay, another one. Is we gonna, yes, another one. No opportunity to DP wasted and no DP baited this time either. One more, DPRC to the wrong direction, but with the use of RC, it's gonna get the wall break, right? No, never mind, it will never get the wall break, like I said. Sinkisk is not about that wall break. Ladies and gentlemen, you heard here, you heard it here first on Bounty Hunters. All right, RC, 5B to prevent Blink from doing anything afterwards. And a jump heavy from the other side. Yep, the multiple amount of jumps available to Chip, making all that possible. Falling straight into the elk hunt. Immediate burst from Link. 
now they have some really good opportunities having a 100 burst meter ready to go can utilize red wine missile if they want spend it on blue burst instead very understandable because like this is one of the one of the go-to victory conditions of the ninja so it's understandable if you want to sort of prefer the blue burst to prevent Chip from getting to his victory condition rather than just allowing him to have it and saving for the red white assault. And here's the other, other side of the coin as well. Chip is very hard to catch, so the opportunities to pressure Chip are way fewer than maybe some other characters. So that in itself could mean that you value your blue burst more. Even though this is a Wild Assault season and not really a, like, Blue Burst season. Very nice. All that from Jump D. Jump D, of course. Very high risk, high reward kind of a tool for Sin. Very hard to hit confirm, but if you get the hit and wish confirm it, you can uh, definitely deal at least 50% of your opponent's life. From the other side, into the Kara overhead, wasn't ready to deal with that. It's gotten so tricky as well since, uh, you know, they improved the ability to, you know, perform those Kararekas. Ah, the backdash! Taking Blink just far enough away. DP works against the Hoof Stomp. Burst. Stay there in the corner. What are we extending with? Nothing left but 50 Burst. Sorry, for 50 meter rather, which goes straight into the TB and don't even need the clean hit. For that's gonna deal so much backloaded damage. Backloaded combo damage is basically what Sin Kisk is all about. Like some some combos uh, don't deal a whole lot with just the normals that you're gonna present. Some of the combos might be just like three, four hits, but you slap a super at the end and it almost like doubles most of Sin's combo damage. Oh, another one! DP again! Blink went for it! And that's like a, that's like a, uh, whatchamacallit? Episode 2 throw strikes back because they were playing super back and forth with the DPs earlier and I bet they was like, alright, I think you're, you're, you're probably gonna die try to get the DP because uh, you think I'm gonna do something else, but no, they was immediate, uh, was in fact going for the quotations meaty throw options. Right, 5B, checking, very, very, very rare kind of usage of 5B from Sin, but I like it. Backdash out of the throw, that's gonna enable a big combo here. Just before the wall breaks, one hit. The blink suddenly is out, and gets a punish between the hits, perfect! I think that was probably uh, not what Blink tried to do initially, but she'll happily take it for sure. All right, overhead. 6P, nice! Those are, like, I think if Day manages to get the 6P reaction timing on board, he's gonna have so much success from, uh, from the, uh, at neutral from, uh, from that point on. Trying to wait for it, but Elkhand is one of those jump scares! Such a fast move! Can perhaps be reacted on, uh... So here's the thing, it's feasible to react to Elkhand with a throw, because throw is such a fast startup move, but at neutral it gets so much harder because like Elk is not gonna land on your throw range. So to react you would have to react with something slower, which makes it, you know, uh, from a from a very queer queer point of logic, not reactable, even though it needs to travel some amount of frames. Anyway, while we're talking about something completely unrelated, Day has been able to seize the sixth point here. Now 6-4 is a very classic position, still either player's uh, set to take. But Day is slowly tightening up the noose. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe a noose of their own there with him that DP from half screen. There we go, DP, switch sides, doesn't quite get it, however, this character Chip Zanef is quite good with corner carry. So we're moving straight into the east eastern coast of the screen. Okay, yeah, again, tries to play that meaty hoof stomp, and Blink having none of that. Here's a DP plus. 
RTL taking day completely away from the where the RPS is happening. So missing the punish there. And now very important RPS is the 5k actually catching the jump out from Link. And the Shimmy backdash. Oh baby day scoring the first set point position here in this set. The bar slash rings true, not be not able to cancel though. There we go, the instant air dash jumps heavy once again with punishing. All the grounded buttons available. Good block from Day. No RC was available for Blink, from Blink. And now we're going into the optimal punish combo. Break the wall from any side of the screen. The kiss speciality. The jump heavy actually. Wow. Are you kidding me? It's that thing when the gold actually works against you. Was that what Day meant to do there? Was he trying to perform a setup where you jump heavy, just goes for, like avoids the gold burst on disjoint? Which means if if Blink performs a gold burst, it's gonna lose. I'm 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 taking notes here. Wait, why aren't I doing that? There's a couple of ways you can definitely go about the gold burst. Uh, a lot of characters have the the quotation gold buster, which is like a close slash and then jump cancel into the gold burst and then I beat and punish it and what have you. But that, I mean, that works out as that, that works as well. For all I know. Right, and moving on, Dora returns on Bridget. And Ifrit Ramlethal is gonna be our second and last player making their debuts tonight. Bridget versus Ramlethal, a very rare, I mean, I say rare and we've had Quite a few Ramlethals, in fact, recently. The funny thing is that it hasn't been the same Ramlethal player, which tends to be like the, the cycle of bounty hunters. So like, for example, Jacko. We have a lot of Jacko, but it always tends to be Decoy Snail. With Ram, it's been, you know, various different players week by week. And here's another one. To try their luck in the FD7. Should be an interesting matchup as well. Lots of range for both characters. Lots of potential to set up your uh, zoning game and or flow from the zoning game into their pressure game. Bridget, of course, can set up her yo-yo for additional shenanigans. Uh, Ramlethal has her stone, producing a lot of plus frames from full screen if she so desires. Not to mention, of course, the far slash and five heavy massive reach, which is, you know, kind of identical between both of these characters. Alright, the yo yo girl versus the sword lady. Let's see how it's gonna go. Starting with an aggressive yo yo setup, working out as an anti air there. It's always uh, sort of like a 50-50 like a between which type of yo-yo you would love to use. Of course, as Bridget, you love to have some sort of yo-yo on screen all the time, if possible, so that you can always threaten with the rolling movement from various, uh, various sequences. But the two yo-yos that you can set are very different. I think uh, somebody had a brilliant idea to refer to the the passive yo-yo, the yo-yo that produces a hitbox on the way back as a yo-yo set, and then the yo-yo throw is the one that produces hitbox uh, initially. Yeah, again, going with the yo-yo throw, preventing uh, Ifrit from coming forward. Very important tool in many matchups where, you know, the opponent has reach. Oh, look at that whip punish, though. We didn't even talk about the whip punish yet. Both of these characters reach so far. Wow. <laughs> if it attempting a... I wonder if that was an attempt on the whip punish with a six heavy there. Dalsim limbs, anyone? 
jump K, pulling them back onto the ground. And now Yo-Yo is on the board, expiring momentarily. Here we go with a mix-up city jump D into the pressure. And even though Bridget doesn't have like the biggest rewards from stuff, she, she still deals uh, a decent amount of damage considering, uh, you know, considering how good her pressure is or how safe-ish her pressure is and how long her pressure sequences last. You have a lot of opportunities to build a lot of uh, risk. Right, and there we go with the yo-yo toss again, scoring a ever so important hit and KOing Ifrit out of the first set. Dora goes 1-0. It's been mainly the yo-yo throws, the aggressive yo-yo hitboxes that Dora has been using, which makes sense. It's like you you tend to throw those against characters like, you know, Asuka, uh, Happy Chaos, stuff like that. Characters that you can, or characters that can challenge you from very far away to put an end to their uh, devious schemes. And I believe the same same kind of logic probably goes for Ramlethal as well. Now boxing in the corner, look at that risk! Oh, look at that risk! That's a big Sonic counter! Try to go for a close slash, but the more the butter will take care of that momentarily. Let's see, hard bait. Ifrit not quite ready to bite yet. Going with a burst in the follow-up situation. Dora is rocking with that 50 meter though. So lots of pressure inbound potentially, unless you find the hit and then you just wrap it up. High altitude air dash. Is able to get the pressure pressure started. Set up the yo-yo. If it was trying to press something there. I think it's a it's a like a in pressure situations you can definitely play a little bit of a 50-52. If you think that your opponent is not gonna try to mash anything, you can set up the passive yo-yo, and if you think they will, you can try to uh, frame trap them with the yo-yo toss instead. Right, avoiding a far slash. And now, ooh, the choice of buttons there for if it was jump heavy, which is very vertical in nature instead of horizontal. And Dora, with that air-to-air exchange and the follow-up situation after that getting another one so far really good control for dora if it just hasn't been able to get into a position to do any sort of pressure as dora is just dancing around and mixing it up into an empty low it's probably a small hesitation there waiting for a potential burst right the wall doesn't quite get the hard knockdown but, you know, with the with the rate that Odora has been working with... Oh, was able to see that the burst is coming during the RC! That classic no-impact RC. When you can't feel it, when you can't feel the pop-up of that RC explosion. That means usually the burst is coming. All right, the yo-yo is set. If it is trying to play it safe, Get out of the corner, big opportunity for Ifrit here. Frame traps into, I think that was, not the Rekka, but uh, what's the other one called? Uh, Dauron, that's the, that's the one. Got hit by kickstart, and now the use of 50 meter. Ooh, sets up a mix up instead of uh, getting a full combo. And Mortobata being the massively horizontal reversal super that it is, will be able to reach from that range. We're getting signs of life for signs of life from Ifrit here. The Champadi once again, the mix-up option of choice. And the overhead option is probably the preferred mix-up option from Bridget players, as you can make it very, very reversal safe. Moving from the Champadi into the rest of your string. Right, so toss the explosion. Locks Dora in the corner, but they're too heavy. Uh, for a moment, I was like, is that, wasn't that Ifrit who managed to get that hit? But no, that was a trade from Bridge that's too heavy. Bridge too heavy really resembles, uh, reminds me of the old Kai too heavy. Much more of a different button in this game compared to Exert. 
And Bridget's too heavy is much more, uh, like, I, I think has more potential as a just straight up footsie button in a way. It, I believe it has a very peculiar hitbox that can challenge some buttons. Of course, very, very unsafe on just block. Right, working with a very nice combo, Dora. Ooh, nice crouch, crouch under and punish on the, on the landing frames there. Producing a lot of plus frames. Defend yourself, sir. Jump out. Yep, that ends up being usually the choice. If you want the hard punish options, instant air dash. If you predict that the rock is coming. But then again, Remetal does have options to call, uh, op you know, attempts to get out of that, to air dash out of that as well. You can use, for example, the new flip kick to intercept them from... Um, from that uh, position where you could go for the rock. OTG, no OTG, oh no. <laughs> so Dora gets an opportunity to RPS with a DP still. It's uh, it's understandable though, cause it's, it's the concept of OTG can sometimes be a little more, you know, high level kind of a technique. And not just the technique itself, but the presence of mind to see when your opponent is actually on their last pixel. Because there is a lot of... Oh, oh the Sapra Butter actually ended up whipping there on the Airborne Bridget. And Mortar Butter delivering a lot of damage. Technically, Dora does have the Juice ready to go as well. Also, Reversal Supers as well as DPRCs are available. One of the Swords is left behind. And now we're mixing it up. <gasps> Going for an Empty. I wonder if Dora actually missed the Jump D there or if that was what they were meant to do. Stay tight, yeah, standing up for the jump D overheads, but the pressure is not over if you're not ready to press the buttons, if you're not ready to take your turn. Bridget can sneak in a small delay into a pressure reset into letting all of that hell run loose again. And like we said, those block strings from Bridget are fairly long in nature, so being able to slip in one little pressure reset for, for Bridget can be... Yeah, it can mean you're gonna be blocking just airtight pressure or semi-airtight pressure for the next six seconds. Or five seconds. Let's not exaggerate too much, right? Either way, point stands. Bridget's uh, pressure strings can be extremely long in nature. Soft knockdown here, but with the massive life advantage and the meter advantage as well. There are so many different ways that Dora could end this round. Blazing forward. What are the options that Ifrit is going to require here to swing the momentum around? Once again, the overhead into close slash. Was that a safe jump? This time it worked out. And now the cash out should go to the wall. Dora definitely has the resources to... Oh, but the double hit! The double hit of the 2D ends up breaking the wall. Here we go into a low, and that's very minus there, but Ifrit perhaps either missing their opportunity or lacking the critical information. Bridget definitely is not the most clear-cut kind of characters in the game either so unless you're playing versus Bridget on a regular basis some of those positions where you can attempt to take your turn can slip by basic fighting game stuff of course now flowing into a cross-up oh out of there I mean that works out if your opponent is not ready to react jump slash reading in leading into sufficient amount of plus frames and got the well slash whip our uh, frame trap there as well but now the boxing in the corner will proceed and with the yo-yo active on the field oh it's gonna be a nasty one with the blue rc reversal more to bottom get me out of here it's interesting how you don't really you, you could realistically just do two more tobatos and then just one basic B and B combo, and that should kill Bridget from full health, right? So technically, Ifrit could win these rounds from a very defensive point. 
if they of course manage to get right on the uh, on the Mortabato, not the not the you know easiest thing in the world to do, of course. There we go with the five heavy. Those are exactly the kind of interrupts that we're gonna need. Ramethal has the reach, definitely the content with the reach of Br Bridget's. It's only the will to press those heavy buttons. Ooh, tried to go for a board, the battle probably initially got the close slash, and then what's to follow? My killing machine continues. And Dora continues with their march forward, six points straight. Only needs one more. At this point, Ifrit is gonna need some sort of a miracle here. Like we said, character uh, Remethal is a character that does a lot of damage, even with single touches. And with the very footsie oriented nature of the game plan that is, or the, rather the gameplay that is available here, there's a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a skill gap definitely between here, between, between the players. But that doesn't mean that Ifrit couldn't potentially still work a victory in their curriculum before the game is over. Nice jump out of the sword. Especially when the main body, Ramlethal, is far away, you get so much more opportunities to either dash out or just jump out of the out of the sword explosion. And here we go, not dropping a single combo once again. Dora with the Bridget execution. One away, set point. Is this gonna be how it goes down in history? With one, two, three, it's a very decent, reasonable amount of damage and meter build. Now we need a couple more of those. Try to meet Bridget in the air with that, with that Dauro. Unfortunately, not able to do so again. Another miss there from Dora. But the the, the whiff moves, the whiff moves come so quickly and so hard to react to. One more hit. Here comes the missile. Throws the sword. That was a right. That was a really cool, cool idea. Tagging Bridget out of that rolling movement with the upper sword, but alas, it ends up being what it is, as they say in the industry. And Dora cleans this seven clean sweep. But hopefully, hopefully, if it is not gonna be too discouraged. And you know what they say. Keep practicing, keep reviewing, especially after a set like this, you get a lot of really good footage to check where did the mistakes happen? Where did the opponent mix me up? Where did the opponent reset me? Reviewing stuff like that, very, very important, uh, you know, material for you to get stronger, to improve upon. Especially since the uh, the replay system in Guild Gear has never been the best around, it's cool to get replay footage that you can easily just <coughs> just rewind on uh, you know on double elimination brackets or show match events such as this one. All right, two more to go. First time for a while. I mean, it's, it hasn't been a too long of a while since we saw Maria. Well, this will be Maria picking up the game for the first time in a couple of weeks, allegedly. And it will be High Will on one of uh, one of these rarer characters, I want to say. I think we saw Will on. Elfelt only during the release week of Elfelt, if I recall correctly. I think they haven't been playing uh, the character, you know, at least on Bounty Hunters after that. I might be wrong. <laughs> I usually get these things wrong. A lot of stuff that one has to remember. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes it tends to be like that, especially when it's like your first time on an event like Bounty Hunters. You can only get like so much data from 
uh, services like the rating update. Generally, the more uh, the more you play, the easier it is for the matchmaking team to you know assess your skill level uh, accurately. So sometimes, sometimes the mishma sometimes mismatches like uh, this do happen, and you know. Uh, the matchmaking team, of course, takes full responsibility and we're extremely sorry for, uh, m uh, what's the, what's the thing I'm trying to say? For missing. Alright, so, Elfold versus Nago. Definitely a thing that Elfold enjoys in this matchup is that Nago doesn't have a DP, or at least a standard DP that is just invulnerable. The greatest challenge, I think, on uh, on Elfold is getting into that fucked up pressure position where she gets to run Rekka. Rekka in itself is fairly strong. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pressure tool, it's a mix-up tool that you just can't react to. It loops really well into itself. It converts really well. If you can get to that record position safely, you're pretty you're pretty Gucci. You're it's it's quite likely that you're gonna uh, score some amount of damage from that exchange. On the other hand, it's it's quite unlikely that your opponent will come out of that situation unscathed. However. It is definitely not free to go into that Rekka. You're generally gonna need some sort of a hit, preferably very high attack level move, or, you know, knock them down, lock them down with a Pineberry, stuff like that. And especially against DP characters, DP characters get some extra tools to prevent uh, Elfo from ever going into that Rekka. Because all the Rekka entries always have a gap. So no matter how high attack level move you Gatling from, even if you go like from 5 heavy into Rekka, always a gap, can always reversal super, can always reversal DP. So it's a massive boon that you're, uh, that you're playing against somebody who doesn't have meterless DP on command. Now let's see if Maria still has what it takes they do say that fighting games are kind of like riding a bicycle. And we'll bet uh, we'll put that statement to the test here. Actually, while the game is loading, let me make sure I wanted to check if it was actually only one game that Will has played on On Elf, on Bounty Hunters. Yeah, it's it's actually two. Yeah, two games. So it's 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 definitely more than one. But one of one of Will's uh, least represented characters. <laughs> Rare instance of me rooting for Naga players. Yeah, Elf that much. Damn. I mean, a lot of a lot of Elfo players are not too keen about this character in the current season either. Elfo probably at the moment, at the current, is a little bit of a rare beast. Really hard to find Elfo players in, for example, Celestial. All right, here we go with the Rekkas, and Maria immediately has the RPS 5P, preventing the S Rekka. So how this chain lollipop works is every single Rekka can be cancelled into the S version, which is simply, uh, you know, uh, what should we call it? It's a, it's, a, it's a starter. It resets the situation and after the starter, after the S Rekka, you get two opportunities to go for uh, a follow-up of your choice, which could be high, could be low. Could be an ender, which is a safe way to close out the sequence, or another starter Rekka to start it all over again. And your opponent is, or basically your opponent's job is to guess which one is it gonna be. And if they sleep on the S Rekka like this, 
You might be blocking a lot of that stuff. Here we go. Snakes in another s Rekka again. And it never tops. So much value. And you're guessing, is it gonna be... Oh, I think Will thought that Maria had enough of this and probably was going for a reversal super. But Maria still hold on and waited for Will to go for the heart bait. Very peculiar situation. Very Nagoriyuki kind of a defensive situation as well. I feel like a lot of more, uh, a lot of the more patient Nago players uh, do tend to win like this. It's it's kind of like Nago is a character that doesn't have the fastest buttons, has very specialized buttons for mid range, right? It's kind of like point blank. Nago doesn't have the have the most effective buttons, but as soon as there's a little bit of distance between you and the opponent. As soon as you get to that 5k range, for example, that 2k range, tip range that is, that's when it starts kind of swinging in Nago's favor. So generally defensive situations for Nago Ryuki are like you're trying to push them away, you're trying to wait until they're at a safe distance to press one of your better buttons. Because like you, you have one of the worst jumps in the game. So jumping out often enough is not even an option. So you're kind of like, right, use 50 meter for universal options, reversal supers, or try to put enough distance between you and the opponent so that you could hit your best buttons. Right here where it begins to heavy OTG into a Pineberry setup, flowing into another one. This time close slash OTG and no Rekka entry here. So I think too heavy, too heavy for Elfold is a level three move, right? So that is still interruptible with a six P or five P if you try to go into the S Rekka. Right, missing with the Bay play and I will ready to get punished. Second hit of or the further hits of the jump D. Jump D is an interesting button, very, very much like Bridget Jump D or other, you know, very delayed mix-up to overhead options like that. Because it delays your, you know, your momentum as well. Ooh, slamming them with a jump, with a quick DP there from the round start distance. Now Maria, with being a close slash, I think that won't be able to recover. It could be able to recover. However, it requires very strict timing, I think. The sort of universal frame data of uh, of Strive close slashes makes it possible for you to time it so that on your last active frames, the reversal super from uh, Elfo should be too slow. But, but, it does require you to find that perfect MIDI close slash. Right, DP spending a little bit of blood. Will spending a lot of meter as well on the FD, but at least won't take that risk build up. So it is a, it is of course the eternal question in Guild Gear games. How much meter are you willing to sacrifice on the push block option and to prevent the risk build up? And out through the wall we go. We still have some ways to go for Will and 50 burst, 50 meter to contend with. Oh, but that's right! You can get a you can get a nasty cross-up option there as an Oki. So technically you could skip over some of the reversal options that your opponent might play. Ah, I didn't get a didn't get the ricochet that were, they were looking for. A very common type of shot that Elfo players will try to look for is to miss the shot in the air so that it ricochets back on a delay and makes you extremely plus. But if you connect it on block or on hit, doesn't matter which, it's a, it's a very unassuming fireball. It just doesn't do much. Right, into s Rekka again. Mm, and I think that... I think Will ended on a low Rekka there, which is... Punishable, right? If you don't cancel it. I'm pretty sure. Right, super should take Will through the wall and put Maria in a, in an advantageous position, 2-1, early into the set. Elfold is a relatively soft character in terms of defensive modifiers and stuff. So just a couple of really good combos from uh, Nagori Yuki 
will work in Maria's favor for closing out the rounds. Mankind knew that they and of course, being a being a character without any DPS or any any like notable uh, defensive mechanics other than just you know you know universals. Ooh, nice jump D, putting Will back onto the ground. This time, the low Rekka ends up scoring a hit. However, if you get the mix up on the Rekka's in on the last hit on the third hit, it's that like oh wait hello the jump D, quick custom combos, cool, cool. Super misses the input. Unfortunately, Maria is gonna get an opportunity to play here. Now, would the super punish this 2k? Oh my god, it actually does. And there was technically very little risk for Will to fire that super as well, because they were still sitting on a 50 extra meter after that. Fighting the overhead, one, two, but just like we said, if your Rekka sequence ends on a on a low or a high Rekka, it doesn't provide you with too much frame advantage. And now you can probably see the, the crux of the issue with the chain lollipop. You either, if you want to double it up, the, you get a big, big, big amount of value if you manage to sneak in and S Rekka reset, but, you know, other than that, you're you're probably like uh, it's probably gonna be like your second Rekka in the sequence that is gonna break their guard, or you know, or you're not gonna be looking for you're not looking at a lot of rewards from that chain lollipop. That's I think that's that that's the, that's what we uh, want to convey here. Now R slash tagging will out of that uh, out of that pineberry there. Drift back with that Hukyo, bait the throw, and now it's on, one more hit. Oh, did you backdash? But Nagoryuki is so good at catching those backdashes. No matter the situation, far slash reaches extremely high, or extremely far, very hard to backdash in the corner. Even if you miss a close slash, you miss a 2k, bet your ass another close slash is coming. Ooh, meets Maria, meets Hukyo with a two heavy, and with a big corner carry. Ooh, tried to reason into another Rekka situation as a as a midi option. But I think misjudging the uh, the distance a little bit. Two K calls out the two heavy here. Footsies happening on screen. Safe jump. One, two, three. Should get the wall break and another slice. Yes, maximum damage. Six heavy from Nagoriki really delivers a lot of brutal damage. So it's from these. It's. I'm. I'm sort of struggling to so far call out what have been the turning boy points in these rounds for Maria. It seems like she. Just manages to find one stray hit into, you know, strong Nago pressure. And will, you know, piloting a character that doesn't have too many great defensive options just eventually succumbs to all of it. Good jump out of that fireball! Even though Nagoriyuki has a very lackluster jump, lacks the instant air dash that you usually want to have against Guild Gear fireballs. You know, jump at the right moment, and you're gonna get a wire fireball punish even on Elf Right, finding a good 2k, 2d, time to potentially mix. Slightly hesitating there, unleashing the Rekka sequence. Oh, and every time, after every sword swipe, there is gonna be an option to cancel into a Kamburi Yuki, which ends up being your last resort. Uh, frame trap from just about any kind of situation. Ah, missed with the two heavy there. So Maria getting an opportunity to get out from corner to corner, using blood, blazing forward. 6k is. Is 6k plus? No, 6k isn't. Wait. Hmm. No, is it... is it plus? I forgot. I am dumb here. <laughs> oh, nice bait there. Backwards Fukio, the classic. The, the maneuver that ended up baiting also bursts. Luckily, no more, but we'll be able to do so on the, uh, on uh, on wire seas. Maria trying to push Will away. 
first deflect shield. Now YRC. YRC definitely does the job a little more effectively. Just puts you in a plus, clean, clean plus 10 situation. But a reversal throw, once again. Delivering for Will. Uh oh, you press that button into a round start DP. Are you unfortunately within the combo there? And also missing the wall break. Perhaps this is what they call the, the little rust. Oh, there we go. Mixing it up. Get the overhead. Present the s Freka enough times and your opponent definitely... Oh, nice. Meeting the... Uh, wait, was that Bridal Express was able to block from that still? Nice. Option selecting it, perhaps. Or perhaps reacting. But the fact of the matter is Maria still does not let will backdash out of those setups it is definitely something that yours truly has learned from <laughs> from uh, just hard earned experience as well those uh backdashes just don't tend to work out against nagori yuki very often well time john wasn't able to intercept from the ground after that the most important thing against uh, Elfo shots, however, is that you don't want to let her have the ricochet. So as long as she doesn't miss the shot, it's it's relatively fine. Doesn't lead into much. Who's sliding into the bite? And now we're mixing. Is someone gonna die soon? So the blood spent. Surprisingly good defense for a high will. But you it will eventually succumb. Minus two, presses buttons. High will on top of that RPS situation after a block six heavy. And now we're mixing. Convert. Not gonna deal too much damage though, and it is costing Will quite a lot of resources. Hard knockdown. What are we mixing with? Cross up into jump D. Do we get the conversion? Yes, indeed. The positive bonus, giving it up for Will. But the me, the, the OK afterwards, it's still going though. This is kind of like the spirit of Elfeld, able to get the resets in in the most strategical places. Ricochet shot, missing the combo, mixing or skipping to the other side with the use of Pineberry. Low, hits the target. One, two, three, RC, keep up the pressure more. Even if you end with the heavy Rekka variant, ooh, the bait there on the throw. Here comes Maria, lots of blood, drifting forward, wants to end it here, but a good jump out of the corner for Will. And now, the sequence that Will was playing, the bar slash 5 heavy into 5 heavy heavy, or the 5, five, five heavy heavy, yeah, that's, the, that's what it is. Really good tool for spacing, boxing, and looking for hit confirms in the corner. Yeah, Will is definitely not done yet. Even though Maria was able to build a couple of rounds of momentum, we're still alive and kicking. Making the DP with round start. Decent RPS victory whenever you're able to make Nagoriyuki whiff with any of uh, his special moves. Because it, it always costs 0.6 blood meter. And generally, no matter who you play against Nagoriyuki, your primary game plan, your most game plan on top should probably be make Nago go on high blood. He's much more easy to manage after that, even though... Oh, he saw that! And that should be a kill. That's a wrap. Yeah, no matter, no matter how much, you know, his the range and frame data of his buttons changes, you would much rather contend with that rather than his special moves that are basically best in slot in the game. Like, that's just, that's just a <laughs> law of nature. Oh, the close slash! Sliding close. It's it's another one of those close slash that activates from surprisingly far away. But it goes with the kit. It's a character that doesn't have any dash. Won't be able to reposition themselves. So it's only it only makes sense that the close slash activates from perhaps slightly further than other characters. Where did that ricochet shot go, though? Maybe shot a little too early here. Into the Rekka once again. Finds the low. And since we are in a corner position, we still can hop into a new one. God damn! RPS still goes. This time, yo, oh! First time presents the open, oh, op, uh, the option of empty Rekka, the S Rekka into a, into a throw or a pressure reset. I think the S Rekka on block is only something like minus two, minus one, minus two, something like that. So it does possess, it does pre uh, present you with an option to, you know, in the heat of the moment, to mix them up 
a pressure, a, a race with your pressure. Dual one. Let's rock. Especially the S Reka into a throw is a is a really demonic option. Got a. I think that was not a ricochet shot, so didn't get the most plus frames out of that. 6P, yep, we got those. And Elkhold, if you get a if you get a decent 6P on high opponent, or opponent in high up in the air, you should get like decent conversions. I think she's like one of the better ones for converting her 6Ps. Nice check there on the forward, Fukio. Is one uh, the first thing that they tell you about the Nagori Yuki matchup. Check them Fukios. And so far, Will has been, <laughs> I say that, Will has been fairly good at checking them so far. Reversal Super works on a close slash. That was not a meaty enough. Close slash to present. All right, spending a lot of blood here, drifting back and forth. None of that makes any difference once you get the BSU and the close slash and the damage. It all comes in and Maria can get even more. Fix the blood, go back to zero. And time to make them guess for their lives. Will is not even close to, or is close to the full burst, but won't have them on the immediate sequence. Missed the DP there. That was meant to KD, or rather KO Will out of the round. But no. Oh, Will really wants to keep this position. Understandable. Left, right. Jump the ends up whiffing. Ah, was the too heavy as well. And Maria comes down with a punishing button. Big opportunity for either player to score. Oh, that was plus. That was so plus. Perfectly spaced there on the Bridal Express. One of those moves, it's uh, it's kind of like came up a minus, came up a light. It's much harder to make it plus at neutral, but oh boy, when you space it perfectly, it really allows you to, you know, skip into the opponent's guard and keep up the pressure. Now Maria's corner pressure, there it goes, the Kamuriyuki, the low frame trap. If the opponent tries to struggle away. Did she hit the button though? I think she did not, right? Yep. No way that came from, oh, nice place from Will. Spends the 100 meter, but is able to bait the YRC. Deflect shield, every single universal option, the resource option thrown at each other. Jumpy! Hard to hit confirm though. Nevertheless, getting a little bit of a, a little bit of a uh, meaty situation light there. And Will actually will be taking the lead here after a small while of Maria's triumphant uh, advance. Look a little little sus there at the start for Will, but I think we're starting to find the groove. Close slash, one of the premium anti-airs. Oh the ricochet! Bringing Maria back into the combo for, uh, combo situation for Will. Mm, was hesitating there. The optimal would have, of course, to be to have the tension to break the wall. Will might have also tried to input the blue while a little too early. Missed it, and at that point, there's no longer an option for you to get the wall break. So we'll just have to live with your live with your choices and your execution. One, two, three. Ending up with the Heavy Rekka. As Doctor ordered, RC from Heavy Rekka is also possible. Oh, again! It's the sequence that Maria has used so much here. Kamuri Yuki, make them block something, and then Fukio backwards. Bait whatever Trey tried to do, trying to do. Maybe a button, maybe a YRC, maybe a throw, and then come back with a vengeance. Speaking of YRC, put Will in the corner. Ooh, able to, able to avoid the Nightless 5k there with the backdash of Elfelds. Slice them out of the sky with a 6 heavy. Ricochet shot, going into the wrong way direction! And now Maria with a big opportunity. Still has one bar of blood available. That's gonna be a wrap. Half burst available going into the last round of this game number 10. Pressure reset with a buy and berry. I think against uh, against uh, Nagaryuki as well, because generally Generally, I think grounded buttons are not the best for calling out uh, pine berries. And since Nagori Yuki has very slow jump, he might kind of struggle a little bit more than some other characters who can just react with an air throw. I mean, the air throw shouldn't be pos uh, impossible for Nagori Yuki either. And perhaps, I don't know, how does how does Nagori Yuki 5B interact with Pineberry? 
Good reflect shield and a good punish afterwards. Two K catches the backdash. No follow up though. The most important thing is that we keep the pressure going. Anti air situation. The, ricoch the shot ricochets will, in fact, into way too far for Maria to find any sort of anti air there. Uh oh. No. No. Help! Uh oh. <laughs> Not like this. Not from 6 3. Or, sorry, 6 4. I think the player is caught on, though. I think. We'll set that. Uh, they noticed. So we. Sh we potentially shouldn't. Uh, shouldn't lose any footage here. Yeah. I think they're just gonna sand back and. Come out of the. Uh, come out of the game. Let's make sure. We have this. <clears throat> Sudden, sudden explosive momentum shift here for Will. For the start of the set, it was generally even-ish or Maria having a small lead. And now, towards the end, when it counts the most, we were able to get some really crucial rounds. And now the pressure is totally on Maria here. But you know, you know who we're talking about. We're talking about somebody who has overcome all sorts of difficult situations from all sorts of, you know, reverse sweep situations. The Viking spirit, she's done it before. And who is to say, who is to deny that it wouldn't happen again? It is no more than three games in a row. You've come, you've overcome worse situations. And what? It's our fault. What could happen? What's the worst that can happen? Getting mixed by some, you know, a couple of wreckers. Here we go. Pressing the, press, uh, pressing the situation right from the right, right from the get go. Scoring a lot of small hits, staggering the pressure. Perhaps looking for Will to go for a burst, but the burst never comes. And now Will gets the mix up. Yeah, that's a punish though. If the last of your records in sequence is a high or a low, and you can't RC, it is punish time. A quick one hit through the wall. I mean, technically three hits, I guess. Into the record we go. From the safest possible button. Five heavy into record is relatively airtight. Ricochet. Oh no, it's ricocheted perfectly, but Maria is actually who gets the combo out of that close slash. Mr. Ender. Still anybody's game. Shots are actually a problem here. Jump over. Oh, try to uh, jump, but that super jump is so slow. And Will is actually able to react with a 6P on the way up. That's how slow those Nagoriyuki jumps are. And high Will, set point. Low, yep, that's a punish. Yeah, one, two, three, deflect shield. Ooh, rare footage of that jump K from Nagoriyuki actually whipping. Will was just too high. Nice air to air. Here we go. We have some block to spend as well. Spent the last of your burst on red, red uh, white wild assault. All right. Lucky for Maria, this will push towards the mid screen, but she still has to be extremely, extremely worried. Because one good combo could end it all. That's a low. No 50 meter yet. The jump D not confirmed. Six heavy. Oh no! The, 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 the pine berry. The pine berry. The tool to contain the beast. That is Kamoriyuki. The Beyblade. Just like we talked earlier, it is a beast tool that grenade takes Elfold airborne above all worries. About <laughs> away from all earthly worries, such as Beyblade clone and other evergreen classics from Nagoriyuki. And there we go. Three straight wins by High Will. And taking it home with that, you know, that character that players just don't, I guess, one of, one of the le least vi vibable characters at the moment by, 
the players of, you know, the elf or player base. It's uh, very convoluted. That's a very convoluted way of saying, I think not a lot of players like to play with elf -alt. That's what I'm trying to say. But she is in a position where she's still waiting for that first uh, big DLC fix patch, kind of. Kind of the same kind of situation where Sin was at the, like, towards the end of season two. I mean, a lot of players say that she needs perhaps a massive kit overhaul of some sorts. But I'll, I'll leave that up to the developers to solve. But what I am interested in here on the last match of the evening on Bounty Hunters, the last seventh match is how is this gonna go between McNuggleton Biken representing Germany and that guy, your boy Spades, one of the wildest, the Anji player from Finland. Now Spades has, uh, Spades really loves to play the reversal of parry supers in the all the most unpredictable of places. Likes to present a lot of aggressive options, likes to go very fast, and likes to mindfuck with their opponent. So let's see if Nuggleton is able to catch the groove, is able to match the pace that is your boy Spades, Anji. Oh, it is... I just noticed, it is the lore matchup as well. It's the... It's the Japanese couple. <laughs> couple. Are they... are they even... I think it's like... They're not a couple, are they, in the lore? Or is it, is it one of those... Is it one of those things nobody knows? I don't know. Either way, two characters that in the past have had a very interesting creed. Biken, defense through... or sorry. Offense through defense, and Anji, defense through offense. But their kits have changed very, very much from the olden days. Back in the day when Biken, when she blocks anything, she could mix you up with guard cancels. Meterless guard cancels that were extremely difficult to do uh, deal with. And Anji, a lot, of her, uh, a lot of his better moves had just straight up guard points, so he could just swing stuff and be invulnerable as he approaches on you. Those kind of days are pretty much over, but some some spirit of their olden kit still uh, still remains on the newest iterations as well. Either way, both characters are really good at uh, expressing, introducing RPS from defensive positions. Both players have a true parry, which, you know, cannot be safe jumped introduces a lot of different kind of RPS. And then of course Anji has his spin, which is a constant kind of, yeah, speaking of the devil, constant kind of RPS timing kind of thing, where Anji is trying to target your pokes with the spin frame so that he could get a big punish. And on the other hand, you're trying to target the either the startup frames or the recovery frames of his spin. And there's quite a lot of variation when he could spin. Could go for a fast spin, could go for a slow spin that extends the spin active frames. Can also combine those versions with his um, his other special moves such as Ko or, uh, or Kujin. You can never be sure, like, how you should be approaching Anji. Ooh, nice punish there! That was a close slash on the hop! Very few players I've seen going for an optimal punish from, you know, that reaction situation. Might have not been reaction, actually. That look, looked so comfortable. Through the wall. One more hit. The Nuggleton is hunting for. Sees, reads the reversal parry coming out and goes for an empty jump throw. 
There we go. The fish, the new move that Anji got in season three, gives him much more opportunities to say, like, stay very stable from those parry follow up situations or those spin follow up situations. Now, the Kabari still is attached for a couple more frames. Spades went for the reversal super once again, but Nuggleton nowhere in sight to strike into that. Here comes the fish again, and every single time the fish can be followed up, even though you can't combo out of it per se, it does hard knock down your opponent and allows you to play the butterfly Oki, the very basic, basic building, or the very basic Oki situation that Anji, you know, can run on the opponent. And it's not the, it's not the most traditional... <laughs> Speaking of, Space was a little too close there to actually run the butterfly Oki. To the other side. Oh, nice! Presses the 2B and aborts the cross-up situation. It's a very akin to Anji's, you know, Hop Fujin follow-up. The, you know, skipping to the other side with Kabari follow-up. If you're not ready for it, it's gonna catch you off guard and get value. Ooh, getting clipped by Cole. Popping up into the air. Can't afford to do so. Because it was only a couple more hits that you needed. And with that RC, making sure that Spades is not gonna drop the combo. No RPS options coming from opponent's burst either, because they don't have it ready. So it only makes sense. Spinning into it. Now, interesting kind of uh, decision making regarding the spin is if you trigger the spin, you have an option to just cash out uh, comfortably with the fish and knock them down. But if you recognize the situation, you might get a punish with a different button instead, such as the, the most coveted option is spin into close slash, which is your best starter. Here we go. Bam! There could have been a follow-up after that, even still. Fun con go con the fun gun combos that you can do, especially with the Kapari attached here. The other side with Yozan. Set them up with the Kata Tatami mapped into potential high throw low. And then cash out through the window. Oh, that rhymes. Damn. She's got it. Right, get the throw, and that should be a wrap here. That throw was combined with a, uh, with a safe jump, though. So, technically, there was an option for Spades to try the reversal parry out of it. But of course, the reversal parry, be it meterless for Biken or metered for Anji, it is always an extremely high commitment. The recovery is counter hit state. So if the opponent reaches you out, goes for a counter hit close slash. Yeah, you're going, you're going for a little bit of a, little bit of a journey into the down. In, whoa, where from where? Cool. You good? You good? Here come the your boy Spades parries. Securing Nuggleton in the corner. This is gonna break the wall. And gonna kill as well. Just like that. The nuttiest thing is when you make yourself minus, then parry, and it breaks the wall, and the opponent is like, dude, what the fuck? Alright, setting up the butterfly, trying to catch Nuggleton out of that jump with a call. Swing a miss, however, swing a miss again, bar slash, goes for the call, no reaction from Nuggleton. Of course, depending on your buttons, you might be able to land a big grounded button on Anji whipping a call. But the very least, no matter what character you're playing, you can jump with Anji and air throw on reaction. Which is, of course, much better than nothing, because if Anji gets to come, come down and press a button for free, out of call, that's, uh, that's, that's not a good look, for sure. All right, early burst out of here. Oh, that's again the, the fireball into sealed air pads kind of a game plan here. Utilized by Anji here with his big little fireball. And if your opponent tries to, you know, wants to jump over it, you can always fire the call. Alright, good read here. OTG, yes, slam him with a six heavy. And Agleton with a little bit of reach here in terms of in terms of burst. However, only one of these characters has access to the royal red-colored Wild Assault. Oh 
Although it's not like Biken can't utilize the blue one assault pretty well as well. Because you get a you get a setup into your S body and plus frames from from your blue white assault. Good, I think this should retry. No! That's actually pretty pretty smart. I smart smart play for your boy spades. That Tenshin might have actually reached, but by drifting backwards, it's just gonna it's just gonna abort no, knock open sequence. In fact the shin that was out already ends up aborting it. There we go. You do see these extremely committal long-range dashes towards Anji sometimes, because if he's dashing at, or if he's dancing at you, if he's spinning at you, throw is one potential option if you don't want to worry about the timing of your strikes. My first out. Ah, but if you don't get a punish on that, Space is ready to RPS you and through the wall exactly like we were talking about. And now you're guessing plus frames, close slash, even more. Gotta overhead face the burst. No burst coming from Nuggleton. I was very good patience by Nuggleton. That combo would have actually killed him. Wow! Balls of steel, as we say in the industry. It's like, no big deal, I'm gonna die with next couple of hits, but... Hey, it is what it is. And if... <laughs> and they... And your opponent ends up hard baiting, and then you're like, huh. Easy. Easiest victory of my life. Oh, okay. Ooh, I think from that situation it is perhaps Biken, because Biken does have access to a 4-framer, right? In the form of his 5B. It is 4-frame, right? So we'll be able to, you know, play better trade situation from that point blank range. Shin, boss frames, back dash out of it, and then we get a big two heavy counter hit, and I surely will go to a kill. Oh, no, never mind. Surely will not go into a kill. <laughs> But the follow-up situation still works out for Bike, and when you get that instant air dash tatami mat into high-low throw, I think your your thing is sitting pretty swimmingly. Right through the wall for spades, 50 meter ready to go. Knuckles on very close to that as well. Is it gonna be enough? This is one of the least. Oh 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 oh! He got it! I was about to say that Super alone will not be enough, but Spades, of course, now I remember, Spades has very keen sense for those kill situations. So we'll cancel out of it and get a couple of extra hits in for good measure. Drive by Yozan to the other side, mix it again, RC, yep, you should be dead here unless the wall gives out too soon. It does not, however, Anji, it's almost like a heavyweight-like character in terms of defensive modifiers. He's definitely one of, not the, you know, doesn't really contend with heavy hitters like Pachankin or Golf Lewis or Nagoriyuki without blood or Slayer, but he's still fairly sturdy, like almost right behind some of those, uh, some of those big boys. Ooh, using the jump D to delay their momentum and go for a tricky timing on the ju safe jump or uh, the jump in. Set up the butterfly, this time from the right distance. And it's time to burst out for Nuggleton. Ooh, the committal dash forward. Oh my god, the IBs into a parry. I wonder if those were parry mashes here. And he converts into... Does he have the combo? Yes, he do. Oh no, he don't. Missing the most important hit. The last hit is what causes the soft dunk down and gives you the positive bonus, which Nuggleton ended up kind of missing there. So now it's your boy Spades on the hard knockdown. Guess for your life. Set up the shin from behind. Technically, dance into a glow slash. The holy grail of Anji hits. Great recognition there. I think it's way easier to recognize when you're dancing from a close distance that you're gonna end up in, you know, glow slash, glow slash range naturally. However, this was not the time to press any, any buttons akin to close slash. Nuggleton, through the wall. Spades has all the resources in the world to RPS this. Yeah, it's that the, thre the threat, the threat of the parry super makes your opponent hesitate and that allows 
you to, you know, access other kinds of venues of escape. Who went, went for that throw a little too early? Missing it, and Nagleton is ready. Right, Shin avoids the Kabarik altogether. Another one. There we go. Na I think Nagi's had, had the right idea there. Trying to jump with Anji and trying to air to air. We have to be fairly early. This time, Nagi's tried to press some sort of a button there because they got punished. There we go! There's the Kalal Slash. And then, airborne hit. Kind of hard to convert. So the two heavy from Bike and misses. But we're still in it to win it in the mix with DJ Biken. Do we get the wall break? Not quite. And the Tatami is not there either. So uh, a little, a little sussy situation, but we, we still, we still get the, we still get the big W. Alright, starting to dance wildly. Hold <laughs> first, all right. Well, that means that Spades ain't gonna have any, any resources to defend with here. We'll just have to contend with Nuggleton on. The good old uh, meterless fundamentals. There we go, close slash, immediate burst. Yep, doubles, doubly good. Avoid all the big close slash damage. Anji is one of the hardest hitting characters in the game, but also keep them in the corner. However, coast to coast, one hit. Ten hits is what is the difference between being in the west coast going to uh, going to the east coast. What right, has the super as well? Yep. Just comfortable confirmed. Then Chi Jin. Big opportunity for Nagleton to potentially put a really big buffer between the two players here. Oh, cool. That's a. I was about to say that's a big hit. It's a very decent starter, but perhaps the position, the angle, just didn't uh, favor space there. Mr. Set up with the butterfly as well. Me, but however, Nuggleton, being the gentleman, also misses their TK Yosan setup. Both players missing back and forth. Oh my God! It's a, it's a, it's a swing fest. It's a brawl, and I think that should be enough. Yeah, just barely at the, at the very tail end of the super. As the set has progressed, players are starting to go wilder and wilder. Here come the dances. Oh, and coming down with the very spaced button. But Knuckleton's time to press it. Go with the over... Oh, oh, uh, the over tribe. Go with the cross-up. That's not quite gonna be enough, but a hard knockdown. Spades with the 50-50. And the frame trap is the option here. Technically, I think, could be parried. But the question is always finding the timing. And if you're contending with, you know, airtight lows or just any any low, lows of any kind, trying to mash a reversal option out is a dangerous endeavor. Because not all of your inputs will consist of blocking. Or, God forbid, blocking into the right direction. Ooh, nice timing there. For, I think this is the first time that Nakuto has been able to time their strike to just straight up punish the the Suigetsu Hakobi, the spin from Anji. An RC using using Ko as a makeshift like air hop. But this reversal super should work out. Yes, nullifies the butterfly as well. Any hit is gonna do for Nakuto. Set up the tatamis. Yeah, the very, very classic defensive posture of biking gamers from back in the day. Move backwards, set up the tatamis. That will require very specific kind of trajectories for your, your opponent to engage if they want to break through that tatami guard. Gonna spades. Scored a very decent starter here. Nakuton recognizes, gets out of there. Uh oh, that's that could usually be killed. Is it is it the far slash? It's yeah, boy space is looking for a close slash, but getting a far slash instead, so the combo keeps dropping in the corner. Is that what's happening? Alright, saving themselves. So if you if you recognize that you touch 
touch the uh, touch the spin frames, there is always an option for you to RC. Is picking off. That should be no. Only two hits. Doesn't go into the last one and jump. Oh, jump slash. Man, that was so close. But Nuggleton staying tight till the very end. Sniffs out the throw attempt. It's it's slightly unfortunate that the, the reversal parry doesn't go into the full animation, doesn't go into the last hit for Anji if it's unleashed from too far away. But hey, you know, it do be what it do be. I mean, Biken doesn't go into the animation of any kind either if she parries from too far away. She just kind of like rejects you, kind of like pushes you away a little bit. Nice, he's the startup. And able to get the throw before Ko actually goes airborne. Nuggleton, turning it up, here comes the Hiragi. I think first or maybe the second parry utilized by Nuggleton in this set. But it's always, like they say, the existence of the threat rather than using the threat itself. Now counter hit 2D is gonna go into a really nice counter hit confirmed with the use of Eska, buddy. Very nice recognition for Nuggleton. Staying safe, coming down into a parry! And is that it? Not quite. And in fact, Spades did not believe in the combo at all. Not even bursting. Not even thinking about bursting. Never mind, he was thinking about it all along! He was thinking about it like it was his last thing that he was thinking about. But it could be a it could be a good burst. <laughs> it was a hero hero burst, but it could have been a good burst. However, the fact of the matter is. Spades is gonna go into this potential last round without any bursts to start with. Boss frames dancing into the overhead. Here comes the Hiragi again. The sudden explosion of the parries. How are we gonna miss it? Double jump, make the call with, get out of the jump. Oh, nice uh, uh, PRC option select here for Spades. Able to maintain a safe position even after that read from Knuckleton. Knuckleton is up backing a lot now. And if Spades recognizes that, gun into a combo. Didn't get the full sequence. Deflect shield, last of Spades. Resources, is that gonna be it? OTG 6 heavy, not enough. He comes down. It's a, no, it's gonna parry into the wrong direction. And Knuckleton gets the punish. It was a good idea, but Knuckleton was approaching from the backside, as is the prerogative of all biking gamers who have attached the Kabari after a throw. I think he might have known it. He might have known that there was a possibility that the reversal parry super was gonna come out. So he goes in from the other side, makes it triggered, or makes it tr triggers it. <laughs> makes the parry triggered. Good English. <clears throat> anyway, I was, uh, that was uh, definitely the hustle that I was looking for. Knuckleton, I feel like. Knuckleton has uh, uh, improved quite a bit during the sort of intermittent period that we've only seen him on Bounty Hunters here and there. Especially since moving back to Biken, since a couple of the other character endeavors, such as the Johnny. Yeah, Knuckleton has, has definitely passed the intermediate pa barrier a while ago. And perhaps looking for new challenges. Who is... Who is the next one on the chopping block? I guess find out next week on Bounty Hunters. If you want to sign up for these events, like we adver advertised earlier, open for just about anybody. Doesn't matter if you, you know, if you are a Celestial Gamer, if you are a tournament goer, doesn't matter if you are Floor 6, uh, what's a good name? Four, six, uh, names starting with S? I don't know. Fuck. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> anyway, if you want to sign up for next week, join our Discord. The sign up forms are going to be posted there in a couple of minutes after we go offline. And we do this every Sunday, 5 p.m. CEST, Central European Summertime. That said, 
what do we have in terms of raid options? I think the gender cross-up is on. And since, since Duck tends to finish around the time when we do as well, let's uh, let's give the gender cross-up another raid. It's uh, I would I would definitely love to participate in that event as well. It's too bad that they basically start when bounty hunters end, though. So it's gonna be extremely rare that I'll be able to uh, sign up for that event myself. Anyway, it's been it's been a fun week as well. Lots of explosive back and forth games. No boring games at all, she said. No problem. This is this is what I'm all about. That said, I'll see you again next Sunday. Till then, stay safe. And peace out.